Hello, and welcome to the NUHS Women in Science and Healthcare and NUS Equal Opportunity and Career Development Office International Women's Day Conference for 2022. This year's theme is Break the Bias, and my name is Swain Chen. And I'm Lena Lim, and we'll be your MCs for today. So we have a very exciting program lined up for you today, so let's go ahead and get started without delay. We would first like to introduce the founding president of NUHS Women in Science and Healthcare, which we affectionately call WISH, to say a few words. Associate Professor Sophia Atalera is also the head and senior consultant at the Division of Infectious Diseases at NUH. Sophia, please. Good morning. Thank you, Lena. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second annual NUHS Women in Science and Healthcare International Women's Day Conference. Similar to last year, our initial hope was for the conference to be a physical meeting where we could interact more, network, celebrate achievements, and exchange ideas for a more equitable future. We then planned for a hybrid meeting, but the current COVID-19 Omicron surge has once again interfered with our plans. So here we are at an all virtual meeting, Zoom problems and all, but I hope you'll find that the topics in discussion will still be as dynamic and vibrant as our subject deserves. As the pandemic has stressed all of us, you may have uh, and may have even reversed some of our gains, it's especially important for our NUHS community to come together and commemorate International Women's Day. We celebrate each year's theme in ways that befit our academic health setting, as well as to participate in the conversation taking place nationally and internationally to empower women in the workforce, specifically in science and in healthcare. The theme for this year's conference and for International Women's Day is Break the Bias. Whether deliberate or unconscious, bias can make it difficult for women to thrive and to move ahead. Knowing that bias exists is a necessary first step, but action is needed to meaningfully level the playing field. Our program today is inspired by this theme. We will hear about and discuss unconscious bias, microaggressions, male allyship, the lived experience, and effects of unconscious bias. Today is special for another reason. It's my last WISH event as our group's president. It's been a great pleasure and an honor to work with the dedicated women and men in the WISH Executive Council, as well as our partners in the School of Medicine's Equal Opportunities and Career Development Office, and our allies in NUHS leadership. Individually, we're all responsible for our own thoughts and actions, all day and every day. Advocacy, inclusive mindsets, and tangible action are needed from all. Collectively and as an organization, we can break the bias in our community, we can break the bias in our workplace on International Women's Day and beyond. We are moving towards an exciting time where the world now expects diversity, equity, and inclusion. We notice its absence and we celebrate its presence. I thank you for choosing to celebrate your International Women's Day with us. It is now my pleasure to introduce for his opening remarks, Professor Yo Kei Guan. He is Irene Tanlian King Professor in Medicine and Oncology and Art Chief Executive, NUHS. Prof Yo, over to you. Thank you, Sophia, and uh, good morning, everyone. President, Madam Halima Yaqub, friends and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for joining us at the uh, today's celebration of the International Women's Day Conference organized by NUHS WISH. We are very honored to have President Madam Halima Yaqub grace our conference this year. Madam President, we very much look forward to hearing from you. As the first female president of Singapore, a strong advocate for an inclusive society and a champion for equity both at home and in the workplace, you are certainly a role model and inspiration for all of us. Yesterday was International Women's Day, an annual occasion that celebrates the political, economic, and social achievements of women all around the world. These celebrations are also paired with a call to action to accelerate strides for gender parity. At NUHS, we want to appreciate our female colleagues every day. Women make up 80% of our 15,000 strong workforce and 90% of our nursing team. Women anchor and lead many important areas of work across care, education, and research throughout NUHS. Our group chiefs of finance, HR, communications, procurement, and our chief well-being officer are female. As an academic health system, we hold the same conviction to create an inclusive culture and workplace where every staff is cared for in the NUHS family, just as we care for our patients and the community. 
Issues about equality and inclusivity are pervasive in all sectors, and of course, healthcare is not immune. It is important for us to recognize that unconscious and conscious bias exists in NUHS, and we should drive policies and initiatives to address these disparities. Although we have achieved parity at many levels of our workforce, I see gender disparity at the leadership level, especially at the CEO and headship level. We've made some progress. In 2018, women held 19% of political and academic leadership posts, and this has increased to 38% in 2020. So this is a positive trend, and we must continue to identify root causes, shift mindsets, and push for change with succession planning and talent de development. It's an ongoing journey, and COVID-19 may have set us back with its unprecedented impact on healthcare workers globally. Studies and research have shown that women are at high risk of burnout as they tend to shoulder a larger load at home. Having to juggle the demands and multiple care responsibilities at work and in the home, more, workforce, more workplace support is required. We have implemented family-friendly workplace policies, including flexible work arrangements. We've also rolled out group policy on professional behavior last year, but certainly more can definitely be done. Progress has been made over the years with WISH playing a critical role. So I'd like to commend Associate Professor Sophia Atreleta for her leadership in WISH since its inception in 2017. Sophia is a respected leader, educator, researcher, and remarkable clinician. And she's been one of our strongest advocates for equal opportunities for all. Undaunted by the pandemic, she led by example on the ground and remain steadfast in the fight against COVID-19 to protect our patients and our frontline teams. This year, Sophia will pass the wish patent to Assistant Professor Melina Sutar, our Chief Wellbeing Officer at NUHS, an equally dynamic leader with multiple hats. I'm confident that Melina will continue the good work and advance workplace equity and inclusion with the same passion. I hope to see more outstanding women at all levels of our leadership. Let's continue to encourage conversations and act on ideas that will bring us closer to an equitable future for women globally. I wish all the speakers and attendees an enjoyable conference and a pleasant day. Thank you. Professor Yeo K. Guan, Chief Executive, National University Health System, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I am pleased to join the National University Health System and UHS's Women in Science and Healthcare WISH International Women's Day Conference 2022. Last year, we commemorated the year of celebrating SG Women. While there has been significant progress, more can be done to support, empower, and advance women. In the science and healthcare sector, for example, we need to continue championing the representation and recognition of women, particularly in areas like research. Women in science and healthcare have played a critical role in the pandemic response. Take, for example, Catherine Leong, who is Assistant Director of Nursing at National University Hospital, NUH. I met her virtually last year, when she was conferred the President's Award for Nurses. At the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, Catherine led a nursing team to set up NUHS's first community care facility in Tuas South, housing approximately 1,600 migrant workers. Despite the language barrier and possibility of contracting the virus, Catherine and her team remain committed to caring for the migrant workers. This was even as she was the primary caregiver to her late father who suffered from Parkinson's disease and dementia. Another example is Dr. Sophia Achuleta, who leads the NUHS Women in Science and Healthcare team. As head and senior consultant of the Division of Infectious Diseases at NUH, she played an important role when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, mobilizing the members of the Infectious Diseases Unit 
to care for COVID-19 patients. She was involved in formulating strategies to manage COVID-19 patients and coordinating with doctors across the NUHS cluster. Her contributions ensured that COVID-19 patients received appropriate medical care in a safe and timely manner. She too is the primary caregiver to her elderly father. Women like Catherine and Dr. Sophia illustrate the extensive contributions that women have made and can make in science and healthcare. But we need more of such examples. Organizations must recognize that women and men bring on board different but equally valuable skill sets, experiences, and perspectives. Like Catherine and Dr. Sophia, many women also balance caregiving with their careers. Family friendly workplace policies, such as flexible work arrangements, will help. The challenge with the current flexible work arrangements is that they are voluntary and depend a great deal on employer support to introduce them. No doubt many enlightened employers have already done so, as they see the value of flexible work arrangements in attracting and retaining employees who would otherwise leave the workforce. This is particularly important in the current labour market, where despite the pandemic, some sectors still suffer from manpower shortage. Moreover, during the pandemic, many people are already working from home, one component of flexibility that will benefit many workers. With the experience gained over a number of years, I certainly think that it is possible for us to do more to make flexible work arrangements take stronger roots in our workplace. We also need to change perceptions among some workers who worry that availing themselves of such schemes will be bad for their career progression, a real problem in some cases. We know too that smaller employers who have very lean workforces or lack HR skills to manage a more flexible and diverse workforce need more help. The issue is often not whether employers in principle support flexible work arrangements but they may lack the capabilities to implement them. As we strive to further women's development, it is also important to take stock of the strides we have made thus far. Today, it is not uncommon for our daughters to dream of becoming doctors. At NUHS, the proportion of female doctors was 43.7% as at end 2021. This is the result of sustained efforts in eradicating preconceived notions on women's roles and can also be attributed in part to the government's decision in 2003 to abolish the quota capping female enrollment in medicine at the National University of Singapore. So we have seen change happen and we must continue to shift mindsets and norms to facilitate greater inclusion and progression of women in the workplace. In closing, I hope that the discussions at this conference will contribute to the larger discourse on how we can collectively make meaningful progress on women's place in society. The government and our wider community must remain committed to building a fairer and more inclusive society, where Singaporeans have equal opportunities to achieve their aspirations. Beyond policies, it is important to deepen and grow the partnership between our women and men founded in respect to create a fairer and more inclusive society. Our consultative partnership and approach have been one of our greatest strengths as seen from the year-long nationwide conversations on Singapore women's development last year. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank and commend all our frontline healthcare workers, many of whom are women. Your courage and selfless service have kept us safe during this pandemic. Some of you have spoken about the fatigue and exhaustion you face in your determination not to let the virus win. You put your own safety on the line 
to protect the rest of us, even as you worry about your own family and loved ones. I urge Singaporeans to show greater appreciation and respect for our healthcare workers who are currently dealing with the Omicron variant. Their work is not easy and we can do our part to support our hospitals and healthcare workers, including alleviating the pressures on our emergency departments. Thank you once again and I wish you a fruitful conference. A big thank you to both Professor Yeo and President Madam Halima Yaakob for their inspiring remarks, which really helped set the stage for the rest of today's program. I would next like to welcome the Dean of the Yonglu Lin School of Medicine at NUS and the Lian Ying Chao Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Professor Chong Yak Tan. Since the inception of WISH, he's been a stalwart champion, a supporter, and an ally as well as a faithful participant in our events and a creative thinker for ideas and initiatives to drive awareness and change. Dean Yap Seng, over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Swain. A very good morning to Madam Halima Yaakob, President of the Republic of Singapore, Professor Yo Kei Guan, Chief Executive of the National University Health System, distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Today, March 9th, marks two weeks since Russia began its invasion of Ukraine. It seems almost unbelievable that 22 years into the 21st century, that we are seeing the repeat of a mistake that men have been making throughout history. That of thinking that differences can be solved by force, of thinking that might is right. Yet, that is not the only mistake men have made throughout the ages. Men have repeatedly chosen to see the world only through their own lenses, through their male tinted glasses, through their goggles of war. Yet, in this war, many Ukrainian women have been deployed to fight on the front lines, and many more have volunteered to stay behind to defend the country. Women contribute so much, but often invisibly and behind the scenes, because many brilliant women have been told that they were too loud, too showy, too strong. Many had their accomplishments disregarded and discounted purely because of their gender. To be taken seriously, women were told they had to do things the right way. It is precisely this, these sorts of presumptions that need to be rejected, echoed by this year's International Women's Day theme, Break the Bias, as they are the biggest obstacles standing in the way of progress for gender equality. I believe that we are making headway in challenging the status quo here in Singapore and are taking steps to get closer to the gender equitable future we envision. Drawing from insights gained in the dialogues and consultations with the general populace, the government will be tabling a white paper in parliament very soon that outlines concrete proposals to give women a more level playing field in Singapore. Madam Halima Yaakob, President of the Republic of Singapore, is the first woman president of Singapore. She was also the first woman speaker of parliament and the first female Malay member of parliament to be elected since Singapore's independence. President Halima Yaakob knows the challenges and barriers women face in Singapore all too well. However, she sort of view that women should never think from a position of weakness, but from a position of strength. She has proved that every woman can aspire to the highest office of the land if they have the courage, determination, and a will to work hard. We have strong women here in NUS Medicine too. The impact women in NUS Medicine have on healthcare is undeniable. From doctors to nurses, researchers, scientists, and administrators, women in NUS Medicine have played and are playing crucial roles in their fields. Two of the most capable women I know, Associate Professors Gan Yun Yuen and Sophia Achuleta, set up the NUS Medicine Office of Equal Opportunities and Career Development, or EOCD, two years ago. And many of the changes they initiated have since taken root and blossomed. I'm sure many of you are now more mindful in ensuring diversity and inclusion when you plan your conferences, more aware of your cognitive biases when making decisions, 
and are ready to challenge male privilege. Thank you, EOCD, for all the work you have done to help NUS Medicine become a more inclusive and diverse workplace. You have my full support as we build towards a gender equal future. In addition to EOCD's efforts, we are steadily and intentionally working to create more opportunities for women in NUS Medicine to grow, thrive, and shine because we really do need more women to contribute with their skills and perspectives. On a broader level, we hope to build a culture of focus on allyship in NUS Medicine, where everyone supports one another's personal growth and development, regardless of gender or background. On that note, NUS Medicine will be launching the inaugural Gender Equity Award to honour and celebrate champions who have agitated for change in gender equity, diversion and inclusion. Once again, thank you for joining us today. I'm excited to hear the various perspectives of our speakers for this year's International Women's Day Conference on how we can truly break the bias. I wish all attendees a meaningful International Women's Day Conference. Thank you. Thank you, Dean, for that inspiring talk. We would now like to invite Dr. Sophia Archuleta on screen again. She will now be speaking about microaggressions, another aspect of sometimes unconscious or implicit human communication that can have big impact on biasness, biases, opportunity, and performance. Dr. Archuleta, over to you. Hello, everyone, again. Um, yeah, we're gonna switch gears uh, from our, uh, the, I guess the, the celebratory part of our, of our meeting today into a more, um, uh, into the more uh, educational and the work that still needs to be done uh, part of the conference. Um, I'll be speaking on the topic of microaggressions uh, with, um, uh, with a, a little bit of uh, dry bits on definitions and terminology. So we're all on um, equal footing and understand each other. And what types of uh, what are types of microaggressions? What they look like, their effect, and what you can do. Uh, and we'll end with the topic of uh, male allyship. Um, uh, Dean Chong mentioned it already, and after me, we'll hear from Professor Jonathan Eisen, who's a living, breathing example of male allyship. Um, I would say so. I'm very excited about this next part. Um, let's dive right in. Um, so there is um, terminology that we use um, in the gender equity or inequity space that I think is important for us to be thinking about. Uh, we talk about glass ceilings, which is the one that most people um, uh, are, of course, uh, aware of. But there's also this idea of sticky floors and broken rungs, um, all of which translate into the broader concept of a leaky pipeline. Uh, essentially, what this means uh, or what it refers to is the idea that uh, if we think of our uh, workforce um, as a pipeline where people enter at the beginning of their careers, progress, thrive, and eventually achieve um, recognition and leader and are awarded leadership positions where they can make change for the future. Um, if we live in a world of sticky floors and broken rungs where there are um, barriers along the way to women's advance, advancement, then ultimately what happens is there is attrition of women um, as we progress um, along the pipeline. Um, we've been trying to establish both this baseline and a way to track the state of our women's pipeline going forward as part of the work that we do for WISH. Uh, we shared some of this during our Lunch and Learn series um, in December. And here's just one example of where we are um, currently. If we look at, for example, the uh, tenure track academic positions uh, through our School of Medicine, uh, we're in a place where uh, even though, for example, with clinician scientists, we have over half um, of the positions that are currently held by women. When we get to the higher academic rank of full professor, only 10 women or 13 percent uh, of our of our overall full professors um, are in fact women. Um, so it is important for us to, to bear this in mind as we move forward. Uh, President Halima Yaakob referred to uh, a very, uh, uh, an example of a policy that was consciously reversed um, back in 2003. And that was the, the change um, uh, that came into effect, uh, eliminating the maximum quota uh, for medical school class at Young Lulin School of Medicine that took effect in 2003. And thanks to that, uh, we've been able to see a lot of changes in the number of women that enter uh, the, the field of medicine here in Singapore. 
this is a uh, this was a very uh, even though it's been I guess next year we'll be celebrating the 20 year anniversary of this change. Uh, the medical school class achieved uh, parity since the reversal of the quota very early on. Uh, but again, we have a lot of work to do as far as the progression of women along the leaky pipeline. Um, I use this image uh, because we can think of uh, bias as one of the barriers uh, that hold back women along progression uh, in the career or academic pipeline. Um, the tip of the iceberg are the things that happen consciously. So, of course, an example of conscious um, uh, of a policy, that, which is a result of conscious bias, was the maximum quota that we had in the medical school class. And it took, of course, conscious effort to reverse that policy and make meaningful change. But there is a big portion of the iceberg that is below the surface, and that is unconscious bias. Uh, what we're going to be doing today is describing an example of uh, primarily unconscious bias, which is the form uh, uh, which manifests itself in the form of microaggressions. Um, and even though we call it unconscious or implicit bias, again, it requires conscious effort on our part to be able to make meaningful change and reverse the negative effects of this. So what are microaggressions? Well, they are subtle, verbal, behavioral, or environmental sl snubs, slights, or insults that are directed at individuals or groups based on certain social characteristics. Today, we'll be focusing on gender, but there are other examples, and we always have to be mindful at the, uh, for example, for, at intersections between, uh, say, gender and race, uh, where there can be even more harmful effects of microaggressions. These implicitly communicate and or engender a hostile or negative sentiment. They're often not intended to be malicious, but ultimately they do cause the feeling of not belonging, which in itself is harmful. So let's look at what are different types of microaggression and what that might look like in our day-to-day -day life. There is further terminology here that can be helpful, uh, although a little bit daunting when you first start learning about this. There are things like microassaults. These are verbal and normal acts that actually attack a person's group or identity. So this might be, uh, you know, this might be look like, a, for example, a faculty member telling a joke that mocks a particular gender or ethnic group. There are micro invalidations, uh, which are common or actions that disregard the thoughts, feelings. Uh, of an individual or group. So for example, a woman physician who is not introduced uh, by their formal title at a conference. There are micro insults um, and there are environmental uh, types of micro ingression. So in a Western uh, context, for example, this might be something like you enter your, your workplace and you see portraits on the wall that reflect accomplishments predominantly of white male colleagues and you may not see yourself represented um, in what's celebrated in your environment. Some other examples from, you know, kind of closer to home, uh, an assertive female dean may be looked at as bossy, while her male counterpart may be looked at as a strong leader. A head of department who tells a female colleague that she doesn't have to worry about chairing a prestigious committee. So again, the intent is to be nice or to be, you know, not malicious, uh, but she's still told that she shouldn't worry about chairing the committee because it takes a lot of time after hours and he knows she has children at home. Other example, at a professor and tenure, uh, excuse me, promotion and tenure committee meeting, every time a female colleague tries to speak, she's interrupted by a male colleague and she just stops speaking. Uh, this is a, 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 an example that's often quoted of a micro invalidation that um, has been looked at with some data behind it. Uh, so again, when, uh, uh, when female physicians are introduced, this is an example from a medical grand rounds um, at the Mayo Clinic. So it happens everywhere. Uh, a, male, uh, a male chairperson is less likely to introduce uh, a female speaker using her, for, uh, her formal title uh, at a significant percentage of the time. So what is the effect of some of these microaggressions um, to the individuals? So recent studies have linked perceived microaggressions with uh, a lot of meaningful outcomes, higher degrees of burnout, increased risk of depression, higher rates of medical errors among residents, um, and they can explain subtle sexism and sex-based discrimination against women. Uh, this is significant for performance, mental health, physical health, and of course, in our academic setting, uh, there, are, uh, there is data that is linked to salary promotions, leadership positions, uh, award of grant and publications, uh, and of course, academic rank, as we just saw. Despite 
all this, there are significant challenges to responding to microaggressions. It's not necessarily an easy thing. Um, we've already said that they tend to be subtle or indirect um, and are often unintentional. Uh, there could be other rationales for the behavior that are offered uh, by individuals. Sometimes there's the perception that this is actually minimal harm. Oh, it's just a joke. The person is overreacting and it's not a, a big deal. But ultimately, the cumulative effect is problematic. And we find that often there's, it's a situation of a catch-22. The individual sort of has to first determine, did a microaggression actually occur? And then you have to figure out how you might want to react uh, so not responding again can have this cumulative detrimental effect. Um, and, you know, there's this perception that there may be negative consequences um, if you say something about it. So what can you do? And this is where we'll spend um, a little bit more time. As a recipient uh, of a microaggression, as a bystander, and ultimately um, as a male ally. So there's this very interesting uh, microaggressions triangle model. Quite simply, what it says is that when you view uh, when you view microaggressions from this human interaction standpoint, you can allow each perspective, that of the recipient, the source, and the bystander, to be considered, and you can help each participant construct responses that begin to build the relationships and restore ultimately justice, uh, which is what uh, I think we can all agree is is important um, as an end result um, of dealing with a microaggression. Uh, this is a, a academic medicine. Uh, the Journal for Clinician Educators has published quite extensively about this. This is just one example uh, of a resource um, that I recommend for folks to, to look up. Um, so there is a disconnect, um, and, there, and this is one of the great reasons why male allyship is so important. There is a disconnect um, between what women and men can perceive. So this is a quote from um, uh, a perspective that was published in the New England Journal. So whereas women report high rates of discrimination and harassment, men in the same departments perceive gender equity. In my experience, when I point out examples of sexism to male colleagues, they often appear shocked. They view stories of gender discrimination or harassment as outliers, as opposed to recognizing misogyny as the status quo. I found that women in medicine tend to believe accounts uh, at face value, whereas conversely, men often interrogate the data, requiring proof and seek alternative explanations. Now, while data is important and is one of the reasons I wish is looking at, um, uh, for example, the, the data and the state of the women's pipeline and um, uh, how we advance through the academic ranks, um, I would argue that male allyship is about simply about paying attention. So data, of course, is important, um, but there is, I think, as human beings, uh, there's nothing that replaces the, the, the strength and importance of the stories that we, that we hear uh, from each other and about each other. So what might this look like? Uh, there's another concept that I think is key here and can help, um, can help us, uh, I guess, grapple or, or wrap our heads around this. Uh, situational awareness is a key element um, of um, uh, of what we, re, uh, what we refer to as male gender intelligence or GQ for short. Uh, so sharpening situational awareness, awareness can require great vigilant, can require vigilance, excuse me, to the gender dynamics operating in the workplace. It demands that men focus in the relational environment, watch carefully and ask curious questions of their female colleagues, and then engage in generous listening. Situationally aware men become more acutely attuned to gender inequities and harassment and are more willing to address them in real time, such as when they see microaggressions taking place. Um, two or three lessons or steps that our male allies can take. Uh, and if you're here in the audience, um, from the bottom of my heart, I thank you. Uh, you can self-educate. Uh, this is highly important, I think, not only for male allies, but also for, for um, other women who are, I, I suppose, uh, starting their journey in the diversity and inclusion um, uh, space. So attending events uh, that are focused around diversity and inclusion, such as those uh, designed by WISH and EOCD, uh, reading about gender in the workplace. So as you're going through all our, for example, our medical education journals, increasingly they have perspectives um, and data studies, um, including randomized control trials uh, that talk about the effect of gender uh, or other uh, types of diversity inclusion policies in the workplace and how to improve them. Uh, so read them, don't skip over them. They're just as important. Ask yourself uh, about the diversity and inclusion policies and ask to see data in your department. Um, again, educating, 
increasing awareness and starting that conversation uh, is so important here. Uh, number two, noticing sexist words, phrases, uh, and importantly, nonverbals. Um, these occur not just in formal dialogue, which I think, um, again, in, in this um, uh, the spectrum between conscious and unconscious effort and conscious and unconscious um, intent, uh, sifting through the ambient noise becomes important. The side conversations, the corridor banter, for example, that's taking place, actively listening for those uh, small slights, objectifying comments or stereotypes that can leave women feeling inferior, uh, unsafe, or simply just excluded or left out uh, from the room. Situationally aware male allies will quickly be able to debug these conversations so they can efficiently disrupt bias and call out the microaggressions when they happen. Again, just simply asking oneself, are women in the room visibly uncomfortable? Um, is somebody uh, fake laughing um, at a joke, for example? Um, so are they uncomfortable with the topic or something that's been said? Uh, again, paying attention uh, to who is included. Go out of your way to make female colleagues feel like they belong. Uh, asking yourself who's in this meeting, who is missing, who is speaking most of the time and who rarely contributes. Um, how can you encourage uh, those who speak less to speak up more? Who is being interrupted and who is being dismissed? Finally, simply asking women about their experiences. I'm curious about some of the things women in this organization find most challenging day to day. Things that I, as a man, might not notice is a way to get the conversation started. If there was something I could be more aware of, perhaps one thing I could start doing every day that might make the workplace better for you and other women, what would that be? If a guy were asking how he could really show up as a male ally to make the workplace fair and more welcoming for women, what would you tell him? Ask the question and listen. One man who took the time to really ask once you put on, uh, reflected, once you put on that lens, you can't take it off. The world really look, never really looks the same. So I will end here and ask you all to consider how will you help break the bias? Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. We hope that this will make us more aware of what we say and do. So now we're very excited to welcome Professor Jonathan Eisen from the University of California, Davis. He is appointed in the Genome Center, the Department of Evolution and Ecology, and the Department of Medical Microbiology and Immunology. And his current research focuses on the evolution, ecology, genomics, and the function of communities of microbes. So Professor Eisen is also heavily involved in science communication and open science activities, and is an active and award-winning blogger and microblogger and he has used his voice to advocate for diversity and inclusion, such as tackling the problem of manos. So this work was chosen by Time magazine in 2020 as one of 16 people and groups fighting for a more equal America. So we're really looking forward to his perspectives on these manos and unconscious bias. So Professor Eisen, over to you. All right. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. And um, that was a really uh, great lead-in talk by Dr. Archuleta. Um, I may get some of the terminology wrong here. I apologize, but I, I'll, I'll try to cover it up um, as much as possible. Um, so what I want to talk about today is basically related to the previous talk, which is to really emphasize that you shouldn't just wait for others to get involved, that you really need to do something related to STEM diversity issues. And in particular, um, what I'm going to talk about is um, women in STEM, but it also relates to other STEM diversity issues, and you can apply it to um, any, other, any other area, um, really. Um, and what I first want to tell you about is an epiphany I had. So I'm kind of embarrassed that it took an epiphany for me to get involved more heavily in STEM diversity issues. My mom has been heavily involved. She's a chemist. She's been an instructor. She worked at an all-women's college teaching chemistry. She's been heavily involved in um, AWIS. I have one of her mugs here uh, with me. Um, and I, I guess I didn't quite hear everything she was saying to me about uh, the challenges that women faced in STEM until 
Um, I was at this conference um, in the mountains outside of LA uh, called Blake Arrowhead Conference Center, UCLA Conference Center. And there was this conference there in my area in microbial genomics. I was one of the speakers at this conference. Um, and I gave my talk and I'm, I'm kind of bad. I can't really sit through a lot of talks in one day at a conference. And even though I really should, I went outside. This is this gorgeous place up in the mountains. And I went um, outside at the conference center. Sorry, my slides are not advancing here. Uh, hang on. Can I go back? Uh, all right. So let's see if that slide comes up. I went outside at the conference center and um, there's this really nice lawn outside at the conference center, and I went out to just hang out there right outside where the conference was. And um, there was a blanket out on the lawn there, and there was a woman sitting on the blanket, and she had a little little baby with her. And I'm sorry, I don't, I, I, my slides are doing some weird thing with advancing here, so I'm just going to assume that... Uh, my, my animations are sort of not working very well here. All right, there they go. Um, so there's this baby. It wasn't a purple baby, but there's this baby on the blanket, and I love little kids. So I went over to ask her, jokingly, probably with some microaggression at the time, what are you doing out here not going to the talks? And she said, oh, I'm not here for the to go to the talks. I'm a nanny who was hired to accompany a graduate student to this conference. Graduate student has a baby, and there's a program at her college that pays for a nanny to come with her so that she can attend the talks um, and, and yet bring her baby to the conference. And I immediately felt shame, I guess you could say. Here I am skipping the talk to go outside and enjoy the sun. And here's this graduate student who's brought her baby to the meeting, has to have a nanny to help her, and she's ditching her baby to go in and listen to the talks. Um, and I just... I suddenly had this epiphany about how challenging life was for this graduate student and how privileged I was to be able to go to this meeting and not really worry about anything. Um, so I went back in and went to the rest of the talks. Um, and one of the talks was, in fact, by this graduate student. I didn't realize that she was speaking, Heather Allen at Wisconsin. I talked to her afterwards. Um, and I asked her more about it, and she said, you know, this whole thing was set up by this professor, Joe Handelsman, who she worked in her lab, and Joe had set up a fund for mothers to pay for babysitters and nannies to come with them to the meeting. And so not only did I sort of see my privilege here and feel bad about it, but I realized you can actually do something. You can actually help people overcome challenges that might, you know, women were more prone to be influenced by this because they're more likely to be the people taking care of the kid. And I just, I went back from that meeting a changed person. I'm not kidding. I just suddenly had this epiphany, both about the challenges and what you can do about them. Joe Handelsman had had a grant from the National Science Foundation as part of this advanced program. I knew that UC Davis had applied for an advanced grant at the time. I went back to UC Davis and contacted the people involved in the advanced project and forced my way into the program and started to get involved in issues like um, what Dr. Achilletta talked about before with implicit and explicit biases affecting women and underrepresented groups in the sciences. I, just as a sad thing, um, uh, Heather Allen passed away uh, a couple years ago of breast cancer um, she was an amazing person. I owe a lot of my whole sort of involvement in this area to her, and I just wanted to mention um, her and her memory. Um, so there's, you know, my, my mom had been giving me these buttons for years, and again, I hadn't really paid attention until having this epiphany. And as was mentioned already, I've spent a lot of time thinking about diversity of speakers at meetings and speaking out about this. Um, and, but I don't really want to talk about this. I want to talk a lot more about, and maybe we can talk later about this in the discussion, about lessons I've learned from my involvement in um, STEM diversity related issues, including related conferences, which I'll come back to. So the first lesson, which I really think is really important to emphasize, is that let's not forget that there is still pervasive, explicit, and conscious bias against women and underrepresented minorities and certain groups in STEM fields. Um, there's pervasive sexual harassment, 
sexual violence, and other types of explicit conscious bias. And you should pay attention to the people who are communicating about this. And I've just highlighted some of them that I sort of pay attention to um, uh, in, you know, working on this area or communicating about it. And I've tried to amplify their voices as much as possible. Um, and, you know, it again, this is a really, really, really important issue. And we must not forget that explicit biases are still there. They haven't gone away. We Some people think, as you heard in the previous talk, oh, you know, there's nothing going on in my department or in my um, area. But really, this is this is a pervasive problem in um, science and STEM areas. Um, and, and, you know, there are many different examples of this. Uh, sexual harassment and violence is one of the biggest examples. There's obviously discrimination of, of various kinds, sexism, racism, um, and other kinds, exclusionary practices and policies, and it's seen at every level, and we need to remember this. Much you know, less probably well appreciated by some people, but also pervasive are the implicit and unconscious biases. We just heard about microaggressions and the various forms of them. There's all sorts of other things that happen that you can consider implicit and unconscious biases. And what I've highlighted here are some of the areas that we know that they impact for women and underrepresented minorities in STEM fields like authorship position, grant funding, seminar invitations, resume review, family leave accommodations, um, teaching evaluations, collaboration offers, editorial positions. This is you know, every one of these things impacts the careers and trajectory of women and underrepresented minorities in STEM fields. And we, we need to keep working on them, keep um, commenting on them, keep uh, trying to find solutions to these areas. Um, the area, again, that I've spent a lot of time thinking about is public representation, and I think public representation matters quite a bit. And what I've focused on a lot is sort of what I consider the low-hanging fruit, which is diversity of speakers and participants at meetings. And you can do a lot about this. And there are some, you know, like horribly egregious examples out there that we call mantles now, or I called yams, yet another mostly male meeting. Um, I've even blogged and critiqued seminar series at my own institution, which is sometimes painful. Um, but, you know, everywhere people have had issues with some of their conferences and seminar series, and you, we need to keep working on this. And again, I don't want to talk about that a lot. It's just sort of a, an area that um, it's very public when you see a conference with, like the one I first criticized, 25 speakers, of which only one of them was female in a field where about 30 to 40% of the senior people were female. So it's just, it's a, it's a big deal and it matters. Um, public representation at, at conferences matters and there are many people that are working on this and I think we need to keep working on it. There's been some improvement, I think, in the last few years, at least some more attention to this area, but it hasn't, it hasn't been solved. Um, sorry, again, I'm having a little bit of a... Slide advancement challenge here. Just gonna restart. Um, so, uh, you know, again, I think it's important to pay attention to what's going on in this area and keep, keep working on it. I'm really sorry, I have apparently broken my slide. Uh, so this is an area where implicit bias creeps in quite a bit. Um, you ask people why they didn't have women speakers. I mean, some of it is explicit bias, where people will just say, you know, women aren't good speakers, so we don't invent that, invite them. But there's a lot of implicit bias where they say, oh, women don't want to speak. They don't say yes when we invite them to our meeting. Um, I asked my friends who to invite, and oh, they all said, told me to invite men to the meeting. We've had, I've had multiple people tell me, we only invite people that we think are going to win a Nobel Prize. And then you ask them how they predict who's going to win a Nobel Prize, and they don't have a algorithm other than famous white men. Um, and uh, I suggest to them that they should gamble on who's going to win the Nobel Prize if they know who's going to win them in the future. Um, 
But it's true, men are more likely to accept unfunded invitations, they're more able to travel, they have more freedom on average, and this isn't true for all men versus all women, but on average, they're more likely to accept. And again, you see all sorts of excuses given that bring out implicit and explicit biases um, for conference organizers that I hope we can fix. Um, but another lesson that I've learned throughout all of this is that, in fact, organizations can change. I've been very impressed overall with what's happened at UC Davis, in particular since the Advanced Project uh, came out. And I've seen a lot of colleagues get much more vocal and much more involved in um, promoting diversity-related issues. Um, this started with the chancellor of UC Davis, who was the PI of the grant, but there are a huge number of people and institutions throughout UC Davis that I think have done a, a really quite um, quite incredible job with uh, diversity-related issues. Um, we have a new program that's focused not just on women um, uh, in STEM fields, but on underrepresented minorities in STEM fields related to the Advanced Project. And again, there have been a huge number of people at UC Davis um, that have been involved in these projects, and I'm, I'm kind of inspired uh, by a lot of them and what you can do. And the Advanced Project, for people who don't know, the program at NSF is basically tasked with working on policies and practices at an institution and trying to um, improve the hiring, retention, and promotion of women and underrepresented minorities in the faculty level in STEM fields. And um, again, I've been impressed that organizations can actually change. Um, another lesson which gets to something that um, was raised in the previous talk is that it's really important to listen to and amplify the voices of others in this area. And again, um, there have been a huge number. I'm, I'm very active in social media. I've been to a lot of conferences that are about science communication. And uh, since my epiphany, um, I've tried really hard uh, to spend more time just listening and amplifying voices. I don't always have to comment. I don't always have to say why I think someone's voice is important. I've been trying really hard to just, if someone says something that they think is important related to STEM diversity, to try and amplify their voices. And, you know, uh, I don't even always understand what they're saying. I don't even always um instinctively necessarily agree with their comments. I think I have some of that microaggression and bias that Dr. Achilletta talked about where I think, oh, I want to see the data behind this. I want to, you know, see more about this. But I think it's really important to not ask for that all the time and to just listen and communicate um, and help other people communicate about what they perceive to be important issues. Um, it's a uh, getting dark in here. It's actually sunset right here. So I know you're in the morning over there and uh, my room's getting dark, but I'll, I'll be done while I, the, uh, I get dark here and then I'll figure out how to turn on the lights. So there are a few other um, uh, lessons that I just want to highlight, although not talk about in, in a lot of detail. Um, and uh, don't forget, I mean, we're talking, we're sort of emphasizing academia here, but industry needs to change too. Um, there's not just one angle on diversity. I spend a lot of time working on women and STEM issues, but there are many other aspects of diversity, gender, race, ethnicity, country of origin, um, age, stage of career that, that also are affected by implicit and explicit biases. Another really important thing, I'm a tenured professor. This um, People should use their privilege. I feel very privileged most of the time, and it's shameful to me that people who have sort of a secure job position don't use their privilege more to try and improve the field. Um, uh, never kick down is a really important thing in this area. Um, uh, you see a lot of when people like a graduate student comments about some diversity issue, some tenured professor starting to criticize them and attack them and say they're stupid or something, it's really important to not do that. Um, it's also important when you do something wrong to apologize for it. Um, this, uh, there, there was one uh, comment, I think, in Dr. Achilletta's talk about uh, fairness or a few comments. I think this is really, really important is that this isn't just about diversity, right? This is about 
being fair to everyone and giving everybody a fair chance in STEM fields or in industry or in science or in other things. And we all benefit from that fairness. And whenever we have implicit and explicit biases against people, that damages the entire operation that we're working under because it's unfair. Um, and we all also benefit from the diversity that emerges when we improve our operations and improve our fairness. So I will end it with that, going back to my spot of my epiphany at Lake Arrowhead. Um, I still am sort of ashamed and amazed that I it took this event to really open my eyes to what was going on and to appreciating um, the area uh, and the field. And I'm just very grateful for what Dr. Handelsman had done and what Heather Allen and her comments to me and for opening my eyes to the challenges that people face and that we can do something about it. And I'll end there. Thank you very much, Professor Archuleta, for your uh, talk on microaggressions and Professor Eisen as well for this you know, really great tour through a lot of uh, advice that we can use to talk about today's theme of break the bias. And so to continue with these ideas, we're now gonna move directly into our panel discussion on lived experience. Again, we welcome any questions from the audience. Uh, and if you have questions, please use the Zoom Q&A function to submit them at any time where the moderators will be monitoring that channel. So uh, as we've already just heard from Professor Eisen, uh, I'd like to introduce the other panel members uh, and I'll do this one by one so they can each say a few words before we get started uh, with the discussion proper. So first we have Chief Nurse Margaret Lee. She leads nursing services at Alexandra Hospital, which is part of the National University Health System in Singapore. She is also an adjunct associate professor at the Alice Lee Center for Nursing Studies at the Yonglu Lin School of Medicine. Her professional interests include people development, organizational learning, patient advocacy, and leading change. And she's led efforts in the development and implementation of nursing professional development frameworks and leadership development roadmaps for nurse leaders. She's also the chair of the Nursing Resilience Work, work Group, as well as co-chair for the Patient Advocacy Steering Committee at the NUHS level. So I think she's a perfect person to have on this panel to talk about some of these systemic things we can do to talk about um, institutional bias and institutional, institutional changes that we could uh, try to implement. And so, uh, Ms. Lee, I'll hand it over to you for some comments first. Thank you very much, Sreen, and good morning, everyone. Um, this is really a great privilege to be here. Um, so, well, I, I'm going to speak from the angle of me being a nurse. Um, so clearly, um, uh, this is where the situation is reversed, um, because um, when we talk about nursing, um, a predominant uh, prefer, um, proportion of the workforce um, are females. In fact, in NUHS nursing, um, nine out of 10 of our nurses are females. And there are experiences that we, we have gained. Um, and I will speak from the capacity, um, not just as a chief nurse, but um, really as, um, as a nurse um, to begin with. So um, very often the kind of struggles that I see, um, you know, the women in nursing do face a lot of the struggles that have been shared and um, demonstrated uh, through the sharing of um, our speakers earlier. But um, the great opportunity is in how the women in nursing can have an impact on the male nurses who choose to answer this calling to nurse. So one of the most pivotal experience I had was several years ago when I had the opportunity to speak to an entire cohort of nursing students. And um, this particular male student stood up and asked me and said, is it possible for a male nurse to work in uh, obstetrics and gynecology practice? So my response is, why not? So his response to me then is that um, this is not allowed. Um, my lecturers have told me um, not to choose this field because it's gonna be very difficult. So that got me thinking about the kind of struggles, you know, um, you know, inversely the males in nursing are actually facing. And along with this, there were many other examples, like for example, um, nurses, the male nurses tend to gravitate towards choosing psychiatric nursing as a specialty. Uh, the, the situation has really um, improved a lot more and it's a lot more balanced today, um, but there will be a certain specialty that nurses, um, male nurses are kind of um, encouraged to take on as opposed to the others. 
perhaps um, is the perception that um, a lot of the other specialty like um, neonatal ICU intensive care requires nurses to be very meticulous, hence it may not be very suitable for the male nurses. In terms of projects and assignments, Sometimes um, the male nurses are, are looked upon to be taking on um, the more transformative type of um, um, projects and assignments, whereas the uh, female nurses are looked upon as uh, more suitable for the compliance auditory type of um, assignments where uh, we, they require um, people to be more uh, detailed um, not to miss out on um, detail, um, you know, very pertinent information. So these are just some examples which um, does have a great impact, which also presents great opportunity for nursing uh, to advance forward if there are uh, measures put in place and also uh, structures put in place and um, policies to support. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and thanks for sharing some of these experiences. Uh, this is exactly what we want to uh, get into uh, in the heart of the discussion here as we get into this. So, but before we get there, uh, next is going to be Dr. Gao Mingqi. She's a third year resident at NUHS, or in NUHS Internal Medicine, and she's the chief resident for postgraduate education matters. She graduated from NUS Yong Lulin School of Medicine in 2018, and I'll hand it over to Dr. Gao for a few introductory comments. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you again for inviting me. I think this is a great opportunity for me to be able to share some perspectives on this from a junior doctor and a trainee's point of view. I think uh, right now in NUHS internal medicine, there's actually a good balance of female and male residents. And we do have a good mix of residents from different backgrounds who graduated from different medical schools. And I think that this diversity is very, very interesting and it's also very, very helpful for our training. Um, at this stage in our career, we are also at a juncture where we have to make many big decisions about where to go in terms of our career, whether to pursue further training, um, whether to take on new job responsibilities. And we are also at the stage where many of us may be taking on new roles. We may be starting families. And we are also learning how to juggle between these new roles that we're handling. And I think at this stage, unconscious bias still exists. Um, for example, so sometimes when we approach seniors for advice on whether to pursue further training in a special field, um, they may focus on whether you have any new family plans in the next couple of years and whether you'll be able to juggle these responsibilities. When we attend interviews and the interview, interviewing committee may choose to focus on whether you, again, whether you have family responsibilities in the coming years and whether you'll be able to balance training with these uh, family responsibilities. Now, I think that on the contrary, a male counterpart applying for the same training opportunity, the same job responsibility may not, um, may not have such a big focus on this during their interview processes. And I think obviously this is something quite complex. And I think a part of it is due to the differences in our culture view of gender roles in our society in terms of family and caregiving. And then I think that um, starting families and having plans with children in their training years can pose a significant risk to male training, to female trainees um, in terms of them leaving before they can pursue further training and sub-specialization. And I do think that this is something that should be addressed. Now, I think that unconscious bias can be seen at many levels of expertise and in different situations as well. And sometimes it can just be in a, in a form of a comment set in passing. For example, um, in, in the wards, we may hear comments like, oh, you know, why not let the male doctor lead the resuscitation because it's stronger than the girl. Um, or sometimes it may be even be in the form of a comment that comes from our patients. For example, our patients may choose to address the male uh, medical officers as Dr. So-and-so, and then turn to the female medical officer and address them as Missy or a girl. And I think in dealing with these situations, there's really no simple answers and there's no one way that fits all. And I think it really depends on the individual and the exact situation um, that we're faces. But I think it's important to be aware that these simple things and this simple throwaway comment are actually uh, sources of uh, microaggression and they do exist in the workplace right now. And being able to recognize these situations as microaggression is actually a good place to start. Um, I think ultimately having a good balance of people, different gender, people from different backgrounds is just beneficial to training and it also adds to the diversity. Um, it, is, it is important that um, ultimately we have equity in training and career opportunities 
And then it's important to have good support for female trainees who may want to pursue further specialization, further training, but who may also have other responsibilities in her family or her home. So thank you so much for inviting me again today. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Gao. And I think really you are providing uh, some valuable uh, alternative perspectives uh, compared to some of the other um, panel members we have here. So uh, welcome and thanks for joining us today. So the last panel member that we have uh, that we'll introduce is Professor Melina Sapaya. She is the Chief Wellbeing Officer at NUHS. Her office cares for 15,000 staff across the healthcare campuses and schools. She's initially a food scientist by training, but she also now has an international MBA and a doctorate in medical education. And her career, so she's very well traveled, her career has taken her to Italy, France, Austria, Germany, the UK, and Singapore. And at this point, I'll hand it over to Professor Zapaya for some opening comments. Thank you very much, Swain. Um, good morning to everyone here today at the conference. Um, I wanted to say that my mother is a nurse and a midwife. And for me, that role model um, has always stuck with me. Um, I tried to do um, as much as I could in the spheres of being a mother as well as a wife. And in my professional sphere, um, for many years, I was what is known as a traveling spouse. So whilst my husband had a linear career and was being sort of courted and headhunted from one position to another in different countries, I um, got better and better at packing and unpacking and learning a new language each time um, before I could actually go for job interviews and then actually secure a job later on. So it reminded me a little bit of Ginger Rogers. She said that Fred Astaire dances perfectly and beautifully. I do the same thing in high heels and backwards. So, you know, um, that sort of sums up in a nutshell um, the challenges that I faced as, um, you know, I progressed in my career. At the same time, um, we, in, in my current role as um, Chief Wellbeing Officer, We've heard today about microaggressions, but I just wanted to say um, something about macroaggressions that we probably don't address as much. Um, first of all, it's a little bit disturbing and it's uncomfortable. Um, just this week, um, I got a call from the sleep senior clinician saying, you know, could you help? There's someone with me right now that I've just assessed who's not too well, um, very much in distress. And this member of staff has been loosened at home by the spouse. And um, my immediate thoughts, thank goodness this doesn't happen often. I, I do get these sort of distress calls and I say, all right, um, it's probably not within our purview when it happens at home, it becomes, a sort of uh, bigger case that may involve the police and other uh, risk stakeholders. But my initial thought was, you know, as, as a woman and, and a mother, um, his mother obviously didn't bring him up very well. It was not very gentlemanly to do that. And a sort of um, feeling of being revolted, like, you know, I'd like to throttle him and tell him not to do that. But at the same time, my role is to support staff. And um, in, in that, you know, balancing the micro as well as macro aggressions that women face every day, um, I, I'd like to see a little bit more openness that people are able to talk about it, people are able to seek help um, because undergoing such events and experiences, uh, first of all, very isolating and um, um, difficult. But if we can actually speak up and um, say it in the most, um, I suppose, elegant and 
factual ways, we would be able to get some help. There will be greater awareness of the different types of challenges women face. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Sapaya. And uh, I think uh, we're aware of uh, perhaps some sound issues here and uh, some people are trying to figure out like how to work that out, but there may be some technical issues that uh, still persist for a few minutes. But um, we're gonna now move into the discussion directly. And you know, to, there are already a few questions in the Q&A. Uh, so thank you very much for submitting those. Please continue to do so. Uh, to start things off, uh, I'd like to just sort of touch on a few things that have been mentioned uh, in you know, both the opening comments as well as some of the talks previously. I think one thing you know, is really how do you get to this point that even sort of realizing Right, you know, we're talking about microaggressions or unconscious bias, and, and just sort of realizing it is the first step. And you know, Professor Eisen, uh, you know, told us about this experience he had, where sort of had this epiphany. And we've seen several kind of um, uh, somewhat, I guess you would say, dramatic. Like they really are quite good at communicating the message, right? Like so, the the stories that um, uh, M Melina just shared. Uh, sort of remind me of that cartoon that was in Pro Professor Archuleta's uh, talk about how, you know, like you've got the, the sort of the washing machine as well as the laundry lines uh, on, the, on the racetrack and then the men have a clear track forward. And so there, there are these things where, okay, you know, that's very clear and that, that sort of makes it um, a kind of dramatic and easy message. But then the stories that um, Dr. Gao and uh, Miss Lee shared about you know, things that are a bit more complicated in, in real scenarios. And I think that's really where it hits, right? Uh, there, there's cartoons which might be very clear in their messaging. But then in reality, things are a bit more complicated. So what I'd like to do is maybe, you know, take Dr. Gao's scenario, right? Where, oh, let's, let's have this, uh, you know, the male resident lead the resuscitation because, oh, he may be stronger. And, you know, there's a lot of complex things going on. There's a lot of things that are interplaying there. And so, uh, you know, I, I'd like us to have a conversation to sort of just get better at talking about these and identifying the issues. And maybe um, if I could start with Dr. Gao, could you sort of expand on that scenario and how, how that made you feel and how you reacted at the time? And maybe, you know, looking back, would you, you know, want to change or like, would you have advice for yourself in that situation? I think this is uh, something that is really said in passing, and I, I don't think the person who made the comment was uh, meant for the comment to be malicious in any way. Um, and but during that moment, I think it, it did give you um, a sensation of feeling that you're not included in the team that's taking care of the patient, and you worry whether it is really because your skill set is not as good as the, the male resident who's on the team. And I feel that that feeling of being excluded from the team is something that's quite significant. To be honest, uh, at that time when the situation occurred, I, I sort of just took it. I'm not sure how to deal with it at that time, whether by bringing it up, whether I will be seen as making a big fuss out of something really small. But uh, listening to the talk today and also in my years of training um, in the past three years, I realized that when, when such situations happen, it's important to identify it. And now I will probably um, find an opportunity to just let the person know about how his command may have made you feel. And, uh, and with a focus on the command itself rather than the person. And uh, hopefully that will bring a little bit of awareness to how such comments and such forms of microaggression can actually make our female colleagues feel uh, in, the, in the workplace. Okay, yeah, I, you know, I think that makes a lot of sense. Maybe we could turn to uh, Professor Eisen and you know, do you have any sort of, you know, as, as someone who, uh, as you mentioned, uh, you're a tenured professor, right? So, so situations can be different um, depending on, uh, you know, which position you're in, right? And, you know, some, some of them have more privilege than others. You maybe sort of, you know, just talk about what are the things that go through your head when you're hearing about these, these scenarios? Well, I mean, so for me, I think one important thing that um, we haven't talked about a lot here is there's no one obvious best solution to every one of these situations. I think it's important to, you know, be aware and to comment when you can. But, you know, I have um, maybe too much of the time used uh, public shaming 
um, as a strategy for dealing with some of these situations. I probably do that less than I used to. I still think it has its uses and its value in some situations, but in many other cases, I think the behind the scenes conversation or it can be very useful. I mean, I think if you, one of the things about privilege that I think is really important is if you, if you observe something happening, if you don't say anything, that's also bad. Um, and if you just let things happen, um, whether they're macroaggressions or, you know, explicit bias or the microaggressions and lots of implicit bias, it, it generally is damaging to everybody there if you, if you don't do anything. But I don't think you have to take the aggressive um, shaming approach that I have used um, all, all the time. And I'll just give you one, one example. I, um, I was invited to a conference um, at the White House, actually, about uh, a few years ago. And stunningly, the, it was a manual, basically. And I complained and I said that this doesn't doesn't seem, you know, like wise. Um, and they were someone responded saying that they thought they invited the it was like the Nobel Prize argument, the best people in each of these particular topics. And I thought about publicly posting about this and, and doing public shaming. But instead, I wrote up what I thought was a polite letter to these people and said, I actually spent the last hour um, going through the literature and I have come up with alternative people for each of your speakers who have more citations, who are further along in their career and have more awards and yet represent more diversity. And I would really suggest that you reconsider your approach to determining who are the best speakers. So I still did something about it, but it was, you know, a different approach. And I, I, I don't know what the best solution is in every case. And I don't think there is a best solution, but I think the number one thing to me is to to not to not ignore things. Yeah, you know, I, I I completely agree, and I think this is this is definitely one of the things that we're hearing, and this is why this is a difficult problem. You know, uh, uh, there is not a, a simple solution that we can just apply, and and therefore it just requires some thought and some care and consideration. In every situation, and uh, you know, it, it's going to take practice to do that. And so, maybe to kind of like turn this back in towards, um, you know, again, like to just sort of dive back into the situation. And you know, this is uh, uh, we're at NUHS, and um, this is women in science and healthcare. Uh, there are often many different roles and on the teams uh, in the in the hospital. And so, maybe I could have uh, uh, Miss Lee sort of comment like. Um, you know, what are the kind of, have you seen situations like what uh, Dr. Gao described? Uh, is, is it, it, does, do the different healthcare roles like play into, uh, you know, how you might think about responding or what some of the considerations are you might be, or do you see similar situations? It, it sounds like you see similar situations in the nursing field as well. Um, yeah, and so maybe I can share an example that happens very often, but perhaps um, it happens so often that um, it becomes something that we don't see and, and it just um, you know, passes by. So um, we do get patients who um, tend to be very disruptive occasionally. And very often um, in the context of um, a very um, constrained um, situation where we would need to ensure that care is rendered for all of the patients on duty, uh, if let's say a female nurse is to be faced with such a patient, the very natural tendency is, is to suggest that um, maybe for the subsequent shifts, uh, let's see if we can put a male nurse on duty so that that can help us address some of these problems. Yeah, while that in itself is um, a, a, a great support, um, if you were to think deeper into it, actually it has repercussions, uh, not just um, on the male nurse, but also uh, on nursing in general. So um, I, I feel that sometimes if we don't think deep enough, and this is where um, the, the mention of uh, choices and decisions comes into play. While you know we think that that is the best way, what if that was not an option? Would we have taken a different approach? 
And by taking this approach, are we just taking the easy way out and not? And as a result, deprioritizing the importance to build certain skill set that would be necessary to help us deal with difficult situations effectively. And in not doing so, does it prevent um, the profession uh, from advancing forward? Because in a healthcare um, landscape, we all work as teams. It don't just necessarily um, affect a single workforce. Um, it will affect other job roles as well, and it will um, affect care in general. So these are the areas where um, you know, we have opportunities, but um, do we stop um, enough? to think through this and look back and see where are the areas where we can do better because some of these um, um, solutions may take a while to put in place, but it, it requires that recognition in order for us to start working on it. Yeah, you know, I think that's a really important perspective in terms of not just what's going to happen in the immediate situation, but then the second order effects. And, and especially, you know, that's a great example, I think, of how potentially individual decisions and the moment may actually impact the entire system, right? What you're talking about, you know, in terms of like, are, are we sort of avoiding like the, the general ability to sort of teach these skills? And so maybe I can turn now to um, Dr. Sapaya and, you know, in terms of thinking, you know, certainly thinking about systemic and, you know, organizational wide uh, uh, kinds of um, uh, changes or activities. Do, do you have any perspectives you want to add to this discussion here on, on this particular scenario? Um, thanks, Sween. I, I'm a little bit nervous because my internet, the Wi-Fi hung just, just earlier on. So I hope I hope I won't suddenly disappear, but it'll be a bit, a bit of a David Copperfield sort of show. Um, You're a little bit soft right now, but uh, you know, we can hear you. So I'll try and speak a bit louder. Um, about systemic um sort of remedies or things that we can do. Um Diversity is a fact, inclusion is an act. And if we sort of remember that, we have to actively you know, make those changes. Um, and other analogies have been you know, being uh, invited to the table and then getting to choose what we're gonna eat. Um, in, in my small team, I tried to, well, consciously or unconsciously uh, build that. So we have, you know, um, various ages ranging from 70 to 30, so that any sort of issues about ageism are uh, not, not apparent. Um, and it consists of uh, various ethnic groups as well, Indian, Punjabi, Chinese, Malay. Um, and some of it is also due to luck and chance because you can't always sort of look out for the various competencies and as well as the various diverse groups of people. But if we pay attention to those, um, it's, it's helpful. And we research shows that organizations or teams that have diverse groups being represented are far more innovative creative and um, the voices are heard as um, Dean Chong said earlier on about the, the various uh, groups and voices. It, it may not be apparent, but if it is in the data, is in the research, then you know that's the evidence we need. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks. And I, you know, I hope, uh, you know, it, it, this is sort of useful in highlighting, yeah, you know, really, I think there is a big dichotomy. Like sometimes we need these simple communications to uh, sort of drive home that awareness or, you know, to, to sort of uh, make an issue clear. But then uh, these things, I think, um, one of the things that uh, we really want to do in terms of trying to make these, these larger scale changes, they are just going to be complex and difficult. Okay, so we're going to move to uh, some of the questions that are coming in. And, uh, you know, again, please thank you for the participation and, and please continue to submit your questions. So um, there's a question from the audience, which is, uh, how can we support working mothers who are looking to upgrade themselves, such as uptake new roles in the organization or, or enrolling into degrees? And I think, um, Professor Eisen, you already provided uh, some examples of that. Maybe I can bounce this back to Melina. Uh, you want to take this question? How can we support working mothers who are looking to upgrade? More, it looks like it's a question specifically about this, this subset of people. 
Yeah, I, I think um, it, we have to sort of work very closely with our heads of department as well as HR to see how we can make their hours more flexible um, in the sense that if we don't have much other support or help at home, then it's going to be difficult to, for the working mothers um, as well as working dads. I, I would like, not like to be sexist in saying, saying that. Um, to be able to do their jobs to their own standards and satisfaction and yet not feel guilty about, you know, abandoning kids um, in that sense. Uh, and Jonathan's example of that mum bringing her nanny to the conference so that she could have a bit of a pulse um, in that sphere, professional as well as personal, is, is not easy. Um, and I think, in general, we tend to set ourselves extremely high standards um, and we want to do it all. We do it to what we call perfect or near perfect. And letting go of some of that perfection is going to help, I think, because in our minds, um, a lot of the time, I speak for myself as well, um, the only person holding us back sometimes is us. And we do have that unconscious bias in our heads. Um, I, I'd encourage all mothers to do the best they can. And if it's not that great, we're going to be a bit late. We're going to be you know, less well-groomed or made up before we get there. I remember going to work and these were countries that were cold. So we often had coats and scarves and I'd have you know, baby vomit or milk curd on, on my clothes. But I was ready to get out of the house and that was it. And I just turn up and it'll be fine. You know, that coat will be dry cleaned at some time. People will get it. Um, it's, it's, it's okay. So support from our team members, our heads of department, as well as HR policies would be a great help. And, um, and, and, lowering certain standards that we set for ourselves so that we can still get through the day and feel happy about it. Okay, thank you. Um, there's another question uh, and you know, this uh, question comes in sort of uh, explicitly says that, um, you know, this, you know, and I think this is great. So uh, this question comes in and says, uh, it's coming from a man. So. Uh, acknowledging that won't fully understand challenges faced by women, but I think trying to take some of the advice that was coming in some of the previous talks, like, you know, what are the questions that you can ask, right? What, what, what's something that I could do essentially, you know, every day or in different situations that would actually help. Right. And uh, maybe I can turn this to, let's have say Dr. Gao, like, uh, and, you know, I don't want to sort of focus on this situation, but it's just such a good situation that you gave, you know, if, if you want, perhaps like to, to put in the context of that, like if someone else had said something in the moment or, you know, um, like as you talk about, I know, like uh, some of the discussions we had were about what, what you might want to do, right? But what would have been helpful, for example, right, that, you know, somebody else could have done and especially if it was, I mean, just someone senior or, um, I, yeah, just uh, can you maybe touch on that? I think that is a great question. I think from my male colleagues, when we're in a situation where a comment may be made and it's a form of microaggression, instead of being just uh, uh, someone who's watching the situation, a bystander, um, we can also take the initiative to recognize the situation and maybe even provide feedback to the person to say that you know this comment uh, may have made our female colleagues feel a certain way. And I think uh, just recognizing and uh, the effort that every single team player has to play in a team is very important. It's something that can do. The other thing about, um, about what our male colleagues, especially male seniors can do is more a change of mindset. Earlier, I talked about how at our stage of training, we're making different career uh, decisions and career choices. And a lot of times when we approach our seniors for advice, um, you know, should, should we go ahead and, and pursue such specialization in this certain field? Um, sometimes they, they would say that, oh, you know, in the next couple of years, you're going to have family, you're going to have children, and they make it sound like such a big obstacle, and they make it sound like we should consider something else, something that's easier, something that uh, probably gives you more family and a work-life balance. And I think that it's really, there can be a change in mindset. Instead of 
portraying these things as obstacles that we cannot cross and we should look for alternatives. I think we should say that, oh, you know, I, I recognize there are challenges ahead, but how can we help you to prepare yourself for, to deal with these different roles? And how can we help you improve and how can we make the work a bit more flexible um, so that you can adapt to the different roles that you're planning to take up? So that change in mindset um, from our senior colleagues will be helpful, especially for the junior trainees and the junior doctors. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, that's really great advice. And hopefully, uh, you know, all, all the people here who are in senior, especially those in senior positions, uh, can sort of take some of that and, and, and reflect on uh, whether that can be useful in, in their interactions with their staff. Uh, maybe I can sort of just sort of to, to further that along, Professor Eisen, you know, um, it, it's one thing if someone sort of uh, is already at the point where they you know, think are at the, you know, if they're in the space where they say, oh, maybe, you know, I should think about the things that I can do, but, uh, you know, perhaps you could, I'm going to give you a little more challenging question. What if someone's not there yet? Right. What if like, do you have any advice or do you have any wisdom that you can, you know, suggestions maybe, and we're fully recognizing, of course, that it's not going to be one size fits all, but, you know, maybe just some examples might help. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, that this is common, and you know, we have discussions in departments and in other places where it's very clear that some people are in the category of the person asking the question, uh, where they don't know what to do, but they want to do something, and some people are in the category of you know they're never going to do anything, and um, and then there are a lot of people in between where they haven't yet, you know open their eyes necessarily or really thought about it in detail. And, in you know, I, I think in those cases, it, it is very helpful to have both data and stories, right? They're, they're the anecdotes and the data. I mean, so the stories are important, like the one that I experienced, because it's just so clear that most male graduate students do not go through a challenge where they're trying to decide whether or not to go to a conference with their baby. Um, and, and it's very clear that that create, I mean, it, it does happen to men, but you know, there's a very clear disparity there between men and women at particular career stage and how it has an impact. Um, but you know, that's not, that's an anecdote. That's that. And I think those stories are great, uh, but some people don't want that. They want data. And, um, uh, Dr. Acheleta gave some examples, and I sort of hinted at this, but there, there is an enormous amount of data about the impacts of explicit and implicit bias, and many of the different examples that you've heard about, there are, you know, even double-blind studies of some of them, and there's plenty of sociological literature on this that you can refer to with data and theory and analysis. And I think that that is also very, very helpful. So like, you know, there's a great example that I use a lot, which is that um, if you use uh, impact factor of journal to assess people, that creates a bias against women on average, because women, first of all, are discriminated against, as it has been shown at some of the high impact journals. But in addition, women on average work in fields where those fields do not publish in the highest impact journals. And so it's nothing about their scholarship that is bad. It just happens to be that on average, more women are in fields where the average impact factor of the predominant journals is lower than where men, the, where men are in fields. And therefore, if you use impact factor to judge people, you have created a bias that is unfair. And so if you, if you give examples like that to many people, it, they do, many of people then start to realize that there, there really are effects here. Um, and that can, you know, there are plenty of examples of this with, you know, applications and letter writing and resume review and, you know, a, a huge other list of these things that I think is is useful. So I, I tend to use both the stories and then try and find concrete examples that relate to something that that person cares about. So I use the impact factor one when I talk to people who work in journals, because <laughs> they, they are familiar with that. And then it opens their eyes to some of the challenges. 
Yeah, you know, I, I, I think we could have a long conversation, especially with most of us here in academics on impact factor and, you know, potential ills there. And I, I think certainly it's, you know, you, you sort of just describe it as a, you know, very matter of factly that the, the, the fields on average might have lower impact factor journals, but, you know, it, there's a big question as to whether that's actually generated by an, an, an existing bias already, right? That that's sort of like a foregone conclusion. Okay, we're gonna move on to another question here. Um, and maybe I'll direct this at Ms. Lee. Uh, so there's a question that, um, so I'll just read this out. I think it's great that we talk about how men can support women in the workplace. Wondering if you have some thoughts about how women can support women in the workplace, especially in a more bottom-up approach rather than how higher up management can support this cause. That's, that's really a great question for nursing. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'd say that, um, you know, this is exactly where, you know, the, the premise of where we start has to be that, you know, we're here as humans and we really want to help each other be, to be even better versions of ourselves. So if I were to use nursing as an example again, um, you know, given that we are a great majority females, um, it will be a lot easier for us to, to change the way things are done or decided because we have a minority of uh, males in the workforce. And it should be a lot more apparent to us the kind of challenges they face because some of these are contributed by us, uh, even though unconsciously. And to have that um, opportunity and that will to have those open conversations to see how we can move along together uh, will definitely help. And this will require um, the entire climate um, to be very open and authentic. And this is where uh, leadership has to set the tone because a lot of the engagement and the feedback and the real um, issues are, are gonna be what we hear from the people who are most involved in the processes and the care um, within that population. So the willingness to, to take a concerted effort to want to change these things uh, would be a good starting point, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's that's just the common theme that you know it it, it is going to be management, it is going to be peers, superiors, um, it, it's going to sort of take the entire organization. I think, and so you know, I, I think hopefully uh, you know that message is coming out clearly, and sort of all the different perspectives that we have here is helping with that as well. Okay, so I'm going to move on to another question. And this this you know maybe I, I'll let let's just see who wants to take this question. This. Uh, it sounds like a little bit challenging. So um, this question says, studies have shown that uh, too much emphasis on gender issues may scare away the men. And indeed, research evidence has shown a backlash effect of the Me Too movement that it's, inter uh, that it's uh, sort of unintentionally led men to avoid working or interacting with women. You know, I, I suppose to sort of just avoid any possibility of, of being accused. So. Any comments on this from the panel members? And why don't I just like leave this open as a, you know, whoever wants to start talking first, just go for it. I'll give you five seconds and then I'll assign somebody. <laughs> okay, Swain. Um, I, from a personal perspective, um, men, um, and this is in, Every country I've worked in, in different industries, have been my biggest allies. Um, it's, yeah, it's a, for me, it's a fact. They have lifted and supported and tried to push me through, um, believing in me. Not that the women didn't, but I think they were in a place where they could. Um, so I, you know, I wouldn't. I'd encourage men not to worry too much about um, that sort of repercussions in what you just described, the Me Too uh, movement and the biases, because there's so many other good things that do happen um, and we shouldn't sort of focus on the less good. And I remember very clearly in a predominantly white male, situation where at the job interview I was I am still female 
rather brown um, and a foreigner. Everywhere I go, I'm never the right nationality or race or gender, if, if you like. But, and with three kids in tow, right? So he, in his head, he could have said, she's going to either call in sick a lot or not, not be very effective. And he said, because he's kind of fill all those criteria, he said, um, how soon can you start? So th these, these are the things we need to hear. We, as women, helping other women as well. Um, and, you know, I've rarely been proven wrong or have these first impressions not quite worked out. And I suppose being an educator, it's easy. I get to teach and um, train and groom others and they, they do make it. They just need a little bit of a nudge. And uh, sometimes, you know, the, the, the scary movements or perhaps completely valid movements as well, because they're simply scary to a gender that is not in favor, but they, they, they need to exist because if these movements were just squashed or uh, quelled so that people can imagine that the, these things are not happening, that would be wrong as well. But a proper balance in, in how we view things and how we assess things and not everyone's a bad person. Um, men and women, you know, old and young, of various groups and ethnicities, there's good everywhere. So just look out for it and uh, ride on it. Uh, and I, I've always been fortunate in that sense to have a lot of uh, male help and sponsorship in that sense. Okay, thanks. Uh, you know, I. I... Uh, really, I, I think like the sort of message that that like when you have a supportive environment like that, you know, the, the possibilities for success, you know, the, I, I think that's a loud message that hopefully everyone here can hear and can take that back to their own institutions. Uh, any other reactions on backlash? Maybe maybe I can put uh, Professor Eisen on the spot real quick. Uh, you know, I know I know you're on Twitter a lot and Twitter sometimes can be the realm of very extreme reactions. Uh, do you have any thoughts on, you know, this sort of me too sort of may well that I'm just not going to work with any women and that'll solve that problem? Yeah, I mean, I think there are multiple layers to the backlash. There, there are some cases, like I said about my, you know, public shaming um, issues where the, the approach itself might not be the ideal approach. In every case, um, for calling out attention, I haven't seen that to be, you know, a huge pervasive problem, but it definitely has affected, you know, my approach over the years and my my tone is trying to think about the short and long term uh, impacts of of what I am doing. Um, but you know, some of the backlash in many of these areas is. Um, you know, unjustified and people who are not paying attention to the details and not thinking about, um, you know, what is really going on. So going to the question, I mean, I, it, that the person asked, I think it, there, there really are, it is true that there is some backlash and some of that backlash is stuff that the community can, can work on and modify the approach a little bit. But overall, mostly... In, in the cases that I've seen, most of the backlash is people who were already against uh, that type of approach and using this as an excuse. So you, so you see both and I, you have to be careful. You don't want to change, you don't want to not call something out simply because there is a backlash to calling something out. But if the, you know, if the backlash is, you know, justified as again, I'll just call myself out, you know, that. I have gone to extreme measures sometimes. I have publicly apologized when I have done that because I think, you know, it's important to apologize when you when you cross over a line, and um, and I try to cross over that line less often. 
Uh, and but and and you don't want I don't want to damage a movement or any anything by you know calling something out in a in a excessively antagonistic uh, inappropriate way. So I, I I think about this all the time. I you know. And one other thing I want to mention, which is really, really, really important here is Twitter, for example, women and underrepresented minorities get more backlash than white men do. And, um, and, and it's very clear that a lot of that is mixed in with implicit and explicit biases. And another part of my privilege of being a white male tenured professor is I volunteer to people to call things out, even if I was not the person who noticed it, or even if it's something that I don't care about. I tell people, send me private messages. If you see a manual or a conference you want to call out, you don't have to do it. I will. Um, and and it, it is a big, big, big problem in social media and in general that women and underrepresented minorities face way, way more vitriolic backlash to calling out things than, than white men do. Yeah. Okay. So I, you know, I think these, these, these are again, like, you know, great points as well that hopefully I think uh, there certainly are a lot of people, uh, you know, in this webinar that uh, hold senior positions and, and hopefully, you know, these are just, uh, things that they can sort of um, think about and, and, and see how they're like, if they're already doing this to uh, adjust or, or improve or uh, incorporate this into the, their routines. And I think uh, for many people, there are arenas where they, they will actually have that privilege may, may not be all arenas, right. But th this is something, uh, a, a lesson hopefully that we can all take forward. And again, along the lines of really trying to make systemic change. Okay. So we're about on time right now. So we're going to have to end this. Uh, panel discussion. I'd like to thank all of the members, Professor Eisen, Chief Nurse Lee, Dr. Gao, Professor Supaya. Thank you all for a great discussion and for all of your insights and advice. Thanks to all of you in the audience for all the questions and for being active in this and joining us in this discussion. So the second session of the conference will be focused on the wonderful research from the grant recipients for the 2021 Equal Opportunities Career Development or EOCD seed grants who will now each give a short presentation on their proposed research. So we would now like to introduce Associate Professor Gan Yun Wen, who will introduce the grant recipients. Prof Gan is her Assistant Dean in the recently formed EOCD office, and she is also the co-director of the Infectious Diseases Translational Research Program. Associate Professor Gan, uh, Gan please. Thank you. Thank you, Lina, for the introduction. So I'm really excited that you're still with us for the second half of the conference. And in this section, um, I would like to introduce our three grant recipients and to let them tell you about their very interesting research. So what we'll do is they'll each give their presentation. And after that, we will have a Q&A session after all three presentations are over. So we'll have a combined Q&A session. So first off, I am very excited to introduce Dr. Shafali Shori. And Dr. Shafali Shori is an assistant professor at NUS Nursing, and her research focuses on promoting family and women health. She has designed many psychosocial and educational interventions for various populations, and she specializes in qualitative research design. So she has also received numerous awards uh, the most recent one being the President's Nurse Award 2021 for her research and professional excellence. And so her research title that won her the grant is on job satisfaction and perceptions of female academics across Southeast Asia, a mixed methods study. So with that, I'm going to pass the time over to Dr. Shori. Hello, thank you, Prof Gunn, for your kind introduction. Very good morning, distinguished guests and colleagues. I'm sure you all are having a great time listening to the exciting set of presentations since this morning. It's my now privilege to share with you the topic, uh, which is titled Job Satisfaction and Perceptions of Female Academics Across Southeast Asia, a Mixed Method Study. Before we begin, special thanks to EOCD Seed Grant 2021 for funding this project. 
This is the outline of my presentation today. I'll share with you a brief story, why I chose this project and how I won this grant. And uh, I'll be also sharing with you a finding from a systematic review, which I have recently concluded. It's currently under review, it's unpublished. And um, it has shared some uh, gaps in the literature, which actually uh, made and found the, uh, you know, the, the, basically how we can ground and propose this study. So it formed the ground for my proposal, proposal of which has won this grant. And then I will finish my presentation with some details on this uh, proposal. Uh, though the study has just started, so I don't have any findings, but I'm glad that um, you will enjoy uh, listening to what we have planned in line for you. So without further ado, let me begin. A brief story. I remember vividly attending 2021 WISH conference in March last year, and I was especially moved and inspired by two speakers, Mrs. Sarah Haggett from Elsevier and our very own and ever-inspiring Dean Prof Chong. It was then shared that the gender gaps remain apparent across multiple disciplines and academia. And I'm sure those who are listening to this conference since morning, we have heard from multiple speakers about that. Only 36% of women hold top research positions as associate professors or higher, and only 0.5% of women in ethnic minorities hold leadership roles in academia. As we all know, academic publishing and research grants are essential for our career advancement. However, on average, only 27% of women, they account for authorship. And during COVID, the situation gets worse. It was shown in literature that women produce 27% less publications than men. And that's where I decided to pursue this topic further. Following a typical research process that we nurses are very well known for, I decided to conduct a systematic review to find the research gaps. Well, it didn't take me long to realize that there was limited literature examining this topic. With my special inclination towards qualitative research methods, I decided to do a qualitative systematic review titled Turbulent Academic Journey of Female Academics, a Metasynthesis. I have co-authored this review with my student and Prof Chong, and it is currently under review. Though the review is not published, and I'll be sharing with you just brief summary, but just heads up that many of the review findings are echoed by the panelists this morning, especially from Prof. John, uh, Jonathan and Prof. Sophia. So we included 59 studies in this review, and there were metasynthesis which developed or identified three themes. We used, as shared by Prof. Uh, Sophia this morning in her presentation, leaky pipeline model to explain our findings, as this model offered an overall framework to understand the experiences faced by female academics along the continuum of their careers, especially what helped them in addressing those issues. While the pipeline metaphor may be simplistic and also linear, but it remained useful conceptualizing us for how fraction of female academics they leaks, in other words, they decreases at each stage along the path from early career to the full professor ranks and also leadership roles. The three themes under the overall framework were the conflict between career versus gender and cultural context, blockades for female academics, and the last theme, challenging the leaky pipeline. Each theme, as you can see from these slides with the, the brown text, which shows, um, you know, within that there are some sub themes, but uh, due to time constraints, I'll be only presenting briefly the overall three themes. The first theme, it highlighted the conflict between career versus gender and cultural con context. This was further illustrated in uh, three sub themes titled Performance Brushes and uh, Gender Roles Expectations challenges in seeking tenure and gender discourse in academic mobility. Academics were given a short runway, often early in their career to publish papers and to obtain funding that would secure them a full-time employment or tenure positions. The review findings showed that the women faced two clocks in competition with each other, biological and tenure, in which those seeking parenthood, they had to make deliberate choices about pregnancy and their career. I'm going to quote one of the mother from this review. She shared, to get funding, you have to be internationally mobile. But now I see that my child is not comfortable with new people all the time. I don't want to uproot her very often. I rather forego my promotion. 
Second theme highlighted the challenges faced by female academics who wish to excel in academia, but face blockades in achieving to do so. This theme was supported by two sub-themes, again mentioned in the previous uh, presentation this morning. And these were glass ceiling for female academics and chilly climate. Female academics, they felt, being denied or delayed opportunities for promotion, many women in this review experienced discrimination when applying for higher positions. Others felt that tokenism was observed at work, especially in Asia. Women in this review felt that they were denied promotion based on the traditional family values and models. They were shared things like, quoting, do not have a duty to earn money and that men should remain the primary breadwinners. Women experienced other women-specific hardship. They, they received less support from other women in academia, and uh, they felt in the form of like isolation and gender-specific microaggression, the topic we've been talking about since morning. They suffered the all-men kind of groups and the isolation from that. The third and the last theme from this review highlighted the factors that help the female academics keep going in this leaky pipeline. Despite high work demands, female academics with strong mindset, they found personal enjoyment in their careers. They look for the higher calling and the values instilled during their upbringing were especially important for women in color. Married women, they felt and acknowledged that spousal support was very important. They also highlighted that it was important to form collegial relationships, especially in mentoring opportunities to solicit guidance, advice, access to the important networks. Lastly, women in this review were driven by emulating successful people and having other women as role models in academia. Female academics from Europe, uh, especially um, Norway, they applauded the welfare system such as longer maternity leave, I know we all aspire that, and the parental daycare, which made it easier for them to share childcare equally with their husbands. Some other institutional interventions that help female academics in challenging the pipeline. Uh, these were shared, for example, uh, you know, having some support, for example, giving them opportunities to attend a, uh, and host international conferences, which give them the visibility. And also they requested that how other women can support other women in the workplace, like the bottom up approach. Ultimately, most females felt that they, they unanimously shared that the change must come from the top, where higher management has the authority to develop formal recommendations for dealing with gender inequity. And I'm sure you all will agree how fortunate we all have, are here at NUH, uh, NUHS. As proposed in this uh, review, we already have the top-down top approach. We are having special office, offices around, for example, WISH and EOCD being set up. And most importantly, this morning, opening speeches by the distinguished guests have uh, highlighted that voice coming from the government and to ensure gender inclusivity and equity. Moving on, the review has, or the rather systematic review had uh, uh, brought up some gaps in the literature. And we also have some limitation of this review because the female academics we actually included in this review, they were at a different stage of their tenure career. Some of them were at the earlier stage and some were already tenured. And we all know the experiences may differ. And also we saw that when we consolidate this evidence, uh, the geographical representation uh, was not, you know, globally representative studies in this uh, systematic review, especially we have limited study from Asia and none from Singapore. And also there was lack of uh, focus from faculty specific concerns and that led me to uh, propose the current study. So the title again is the job satisfaction uh, and uh, perceptions of female academics across Southeast Asia, a mixed method study. And I'll give you a little bit of brief on the methodology now. The aim of this study is to examine female ac academics job satisfaction and perceptions across the Southeast Asian affiliated schools and universities. I'll specifically mention later that why the Southeast Asian schools and universities are chosen. As you can see, it's a mixed method study. The quantitative research question focuses on uh, looking at what is the job satisfaction of female academics and qualitatively, we want to explore the experiences and needs of female academics. Now, the study is uh, conceptually based on Hagedon's framework of faculty job satisfaction model, and it has helped us to um, plan the outcomes for this study. According to Hagedon's, uh, to identify three types of mediators to provide the context in which job satisfaction can be considered. These are demographics, motivators and hygienes and environmental conditions. 
First, the demographics. It includes standard items like gender and family factors, but the categories also include institutional characteristics, for example, private or public institutions. The argument is that institutional type creates in-group of workers who share certain similar characteristics, just do as gen gender and ethnicity. Second, motivators increases satisfaction, while hygiene is also known as barriers, it decreases satisfaction. For example, for academics, motivators include achievements like number of publications, recognitions and awards, the nature of the work itself, for example, teaching and research, and responsibilities, for example, hosting a committee services, and advancements um, along their academic ranks. And the barriers or the hygiene, so they may include heavy teaching or advising responsibilities. Third, the category it focuses around environmental conditions, which encompasses working conditions, including social and working relationships. Now, based on this uh, framework, uh, we have developed the methodology. We will be using convenience sampl sampling to invite females from uh, Southeast Asian and East Asian Nursing Education and Research Network is called CNAN, uh, those universities which is affiliated to this group. Why CNAN? Because I represent Singapore on this group and I have collaborators who will be facilitating with the data collection. A mixed method with embedded participatory research design will be used. Quantitative self-administered self surveys will anonymously explore female academics' job satisfaction. And we will be using a validated instrument which will include Hagedon's framework. And qualitatively in-depth interviews will focus on understanding the perception. We are using a participatory design called Photo Voice because Photo Voice is encourage active involvement of the participants in study and also enables researchers to perceive the world from the viewpoints of the participants. I've just concluded one study including Photo Voice and it's really interesting to see the worldview of people uh, uh, from the way they are living. And especially I'm hoping to understand more that uh, how female academics, they perceive their journey, both visually and through their experiences. We will use descriptive and uh, inferential uh, studies for the quantitative data and thematic analysis for the qualitative studies. This is my final slide. I know the time. Uh, so I have already, inf uh, 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 we have received the ethics approval and the data collection has just begun last month. And uh, these are the universities who have already confirmed their participation and data collection has started at Chiang Mai University, Thailand, University of Philippines, University of Indonesia, Finica University, Vietnam, International Islamic University, Malaysia, and of course, National University of Singapore. We are hoping to conclude the data collection by second in half of this year and I'm looking forward to analyze the data and hopefully coming back and presenting with everyone in the next forum. So thank you very much for your active listening and I think uh, I'm just on time. Uh, I think we'll take uh, Q&A at the end of all the uh, presentations. Thank you very much once again for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, Shafali, this is fantastic. It makes me very excited. Uh, just by the way, you're talking and being passionate about your research. So, yeah, so uh, I will invite the audience participants, please key in your questions in the Q&A. So now let me move on to our second speaker in this section. And she is none other than Dr. Hannah Kleppman. So Hannah Kleppman is an assistant professor in the Sawsui Hawk School of Public Health. She's an infectious disease epidemiologist and mathematical modeler. And she also researches how diseases spread and how to control them. You might have seen her in the media uh, as well. So she's interested also in working to support opportunities and research for those from historically underrepresented backgrounds. So this is very interesting. And I'm handing the time over now to Dr. Kleppman. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm really excited to be here today to present to you um, about the work that we have been doing. So I was actually meant to present this time last year, um, but I ended up breaking my foot just before the, the meeting last year and I got excellent care at MUH. So any orthopedics that saw me along the way, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, so I'm, I'm one of the 2020 recipients. Um, and so I'm here to present a little bit about what we've been doing over the last few years. Um, uh, the bulk of the, the heavy lifting in this has been done by a PhD student, Maxine Wei Chi Tan, uh, and a research assistant, uh, Shreya Kandewell. So just to point them out as we, as we start. All right. Okay. So a tiny bit of background, though I think we're all we're all on the same page with this, but just specifically what we decided to look at in, in our study. So there's a body of research out there that's starting to look specifically at gender representation in a number 
of areas in publishing um, and in expert opinion. So I've given a few examples there for people who are interested in looking at this. Um, but there's a whole lot out there going on that I think is, is really um, interesting to, to be looking at and being published in good journals, which is, which is exciting. Um, at the time when we were thinking about this, we were wondering, how does this look in, in Singapore? We, we couldn't find any information out there about what the, what the gender representation was. COVID-19 has also, of course, presented unique challenges. Um, so what we ended up deciding to do was focusing on looking at the representation of women in published scientific papers and the press for COVID-19 in Singapore in 2020. We do hope to update to 2021, but uh, we, we're focusing on the 2020 for now. So I'd really like to thank EOCD WISH for funding to support this work. This is the kind of work that, um, well, we can discuss who should be doing this and how it can be done. Um, but it's really great to have some funding to actually support the time to, to do this work. And it's been approved um, by the Ethics Committee of the Salisbury Hump School of Public Health. So just a little bit on why does it matter? We've heard a lot about this. So uh, you know, we're missing, I think, we, we want to know if we're missing vital voices and perspectives. From, from the literature um, and from the press. Press and papers are metrics of the profession. They're used to, to uh, grade how we're all doing in our profession. So we really want to see if there's any biases that are, that are going on there. And one thing that came up when I was discussing this, this with my team was that it's actually not just important for the individuals or for the research ecosphere, but it's actually important for the next generation of researchers, that they see themselves in the people, in the press, in the papers that are coming out, and they can then imagine themselves doing this work and continuing along this pipeline. And I think that's a really important thing for us to, to think about when we're, when we're looking at this. So a little bit of a sort of step by step of what we what we wanted to do, and we're very focused on the first one at now. We wanted to get the statistics and raise awareness. Um, a slight cheeky comment on whose job is this? I'll argue at the end. This is everybody's job. So uh, we'll we'll see how how you feel about that. And we then, of course, need to understand why the statistics look the way they do and raise awareness. And then ultimately, the hope is that we can change the way that we that we do things if if needed. And we've seen some some excellent examples from from um, previous speakers on how we can we can all do this and how systems can support this. So here we're focusing on papers and press. OK, so a little bit of a busy si slide, but just in case people really want to know the methodology of what we did for the research when we were looking at the COVID-19 research published papers. And um, we used a various, the uh, Shreya who was working on this is, is very tech savvy, so quite a lot of algorithms to scrape various bits of information from, from different places. And one thing to really highlight is that a lot of these this work, when it's done internationally, does use um, algorithms to assign gender to, to authors of papers. And we've found that that's quite problematic uh, in Asia. And so this is something that uh, we uh, really needs to be kind of thought about when we're doing this. We end up with much higher percentage of names that we cannot categorize uh, using these algorithms. And we took some steps to try and look at that by uh, looking at uh, people's profile pages and looking at the, how they identified themselves. Uh, but if we couldn't find that, then we, we could not um, assign. OK, so here's the, the results that we had initially. So of COVID-19 papers uh, that came out of the unique authors that were in those papers in, in 2020, 38% were women um, and 62% were men. Um, and just to highlight, that's out of 2,000 um, authors, and we still had around 750 authors that we couldn't classify. Um, uh, in looking at entry, so this is, you know, an, an author might appear more than once and we count each time that a, an, an author appears. We actually end up being quite similar, which was, was quite reassuring. About 65% are, are men and about 35% um, are women. Um, uh, so, you know, we're perhaps not seeing that we we might have been thinking we might see um, that men were publishing more, though, of course, there's, there's other ways of, of looking um, at this. So I don't know your thoughts on that. It's uh, you know interesting to see what you thought this would look like before and what this what this looks like. We're not at 50-50, but you know we're we're not uh, we're not as far off as maybe we might have been concerned uh, we were. Uh, we then started to look at first authors, and so here we do see a little bit of a dip. So we see that 30% of first authors um, are female, and around 70% uh, were male, and we had around 285. Uh, authors that we couldn't classify uh, in the first author. Um, so we wanted to focus on first author because, you know, that's one of the prominent positions um, in papers. Um, and then we also wanted to look at the last authors. And we do see a, another slight dip here with um, about 25% of last authors being female. We actually had slightly fewer um, um, authors that we couldn't classify here, I think, because of the, the um, 
you know, more senior authors will have, have profile pages and, and those, those kind of things. Another interesting thing that we, we came across was when we're looking at the percent of women in the, in the author list. So on the far left of this table, we see that 45% of papers have either zero or less than 10%, including zero um, women um, in the author list. So we see a real peak there in men, working with men, uh, that's happening there. Uh, there might be something a little bit going on with sole author or international collaborations here. We might have to dig a little bit deeper into the, into the data here. But we interestingly also see this spike on the other end where there's a lot of women only papers, which is something that we have come across in the literature that sometimes women feel they need to create their own, own networks if they're being kind of left out of, out of the other ones. So uh, we thought this was, was an interesting finding, but again, more to dig into with all of these, these statistics. Okay, so we then wanted to look also at the, the press. So we looked at, again, from 2020, um, expert opinion that was given in the press and the English language press in Singapore. So we do have a bias there on looking at COVID-19 spread and control um, issues. Uh, again, using the, the same kind of uh, pro process for assigning gender. And we were able to assign gender to everybody, I think, because everybody's much more high profile who's giving these things. So just to keep that bias in mind when we're, when we're going through the, all of the results. Okay, so of individuals quoted, um, around 25% uh, are female, which is, it, you know, you might argue is in line with the, the senior authors that we're seeing. We might not be, might not be seeing a drop off there. Um, we do see uh, in the number of quotes, we see that only 13% of those are, are women. So perhaps, uh, you know, men are being asked more or are giving quotes more often. To be clear, this is the giving quotes. We don't know about who's been asked at this stage. Um, and then we also looked at um, whether there was uh, only men, only women or both quoted uh, in the articles. And we do see that 75% of articles um, only quoted men in, in, their, in their articles. Uh, and uh, there was, there was a, every time I see one of these, I cheer. There are a small amount out there that only have women. So there's 4% of those that, that only, only um, quote women. So in summary, uh, we looked at the papers, uh, COVID-19 uh, research papers, and we saw that firstly, that using algorithms for assigning gender is particularly hard. And we really need to be careful when we're thinking about this, not to get a, get a skewed picture. Those of you that are working within systems where you're able to get at this information, maybe you would have other ways of, of getting at that, but we couldn't assign gender to 27% of authors. Um, overall, about 40% of authors are women. Among those, we could assign a gender. Uh, fewer female first down to 35% and dropping up again then into last order down to 30%. In the press, the gender of those providing quotes is consistent with slightly lower than the last authors, around 25%. And though women did have proportionally fewer quotes um, and many articles quoted only men. So this, uh, this is our first pass at this kind of analysis. Um, I'd love to hear from you, your thoughts on what we could be doing more, other things we could be looking into. We've had some suggestions for various network analysis. I think there's lots that we could be doing here and hopefully we will also be updating to 2021. A few discussion points. Um, when you're when you're looking at this sort of what do they what do these results uh, make you think what do you what do you feel what are your thoughts when you start to think about these results and and all the discussion we've had so far about how we how we interrogate our, our own processes and our own thoughts so when we when we're uh, uh, confronted with with some of these some of these issues one of the questions we've had along the way is what do we compare this to or I think the kind of other way around of thinking about this is what should we be aiming for in each of these in each of these studies. Why do we see these gender differences? That other, I think some of the qualitative work can really be uh, informative here and some of the stories that we've been, been hearing um, and what can be done about it. And then we of course have the question how COVID specific are these results? So we've been trying to think about what do we compare them to in a non-COVID uh, scenario, not entirely clear to us, but again thoughts on that would be great and you know of course the question were women impacted more than men by the COVID uh, measures. Um, my sort of we've heard some great steps from from various people um, in the in the panels and in the presentations about what what can be done for these and just wanted to add my my sort of 10 cents into the to the discussion I think change can be made at each step of, in the ecosystem by each of us we all have a role to play um, in this one thing that I'm currently in the process of doing is uh, doing my own audit 
So looking back and thinking, okay, what I've published, uh, who am I publishing with? Who am I working with? How is this working out? And we can all do that individually or in the system that we're that we're working in. Think about giving the opportunities, the opportunities to others, who you're giving those opportunities to within your group, and then thinking sort of outside of our, our usual usual networks. And then we can we can think about our perhaps ways of making our working, our way of working more accessible. Um, some some one that's been very informative in in my thinking in this in this field is now Pulitzer Prize winning N Yong, Ed Yong, sorry, um, who wrote uh, before he got his Pulitzer Prize, so it didn't didn't stop him getting getting that um, about how he tried to fix the gender imbalance in his stories. He did his own audit of his own work, and then he worked actively to to look at that. And I find this a very inspiring um, uh, message for and a way of working for for all of us. So thank you very much for your attention today and uh, really looking forward to your, your thoughts on the work. And uh, thanks again for the opportunity to, to share with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. So that was uh, really interesting. And um, I'm really excited to see your last slide. And I think that's really impactful. And that's kind of the take home slide, doing our own audits, giving opportunities to others and so on. So we'll, we'll reserve the time for Q&A later. But now I would move on to introduce the third speaker. Um, and she is none other than Assistant Professor Li Sherying. So Dr. Li Sherying is a Senior Consultant Hematologist at the Department of Laboratory Medicine at NUH, and she heads its Division of Hematology. She's a medical doctor by training and specializes in diagnostic hematology and um, blood transfusion and also benign hematology. And she wears a second hat as assistant prof at the Yong Lulin School of Medicine, Department of Medicine. She's a core faculty in the NUHS Hematology Senior Residency Program. So I'm quite interested to see how she got into, involved into this space on gender uh, equality. So today, the topic of her grant, uh, and which she's going to talk to us about, is on gender and technology-related stress in the healthcare workplace an impact on gender equality, human capital, and potential solutions. So eager to hear that. Over to you, Dr. Lee. So hi, thank you very much for the very kind introduction. So um, good morning. And it's really a great honor to be here. And I would look, first like to thank uh, EOCD and WISH for this wonderful opportunity. This study was conceived by quite a fortuitous turn of events, really, which led to my application for the EOCD WISH grant um, in 2021. So my colleague had forwarded me the grant call email asking if I wanted to place a joint application for a clinical study, thinking that the grant was for women applicants. And on that day itself, I happened to be attending a course at the NUS Business School, and it was also dealing with things arising from the IT revamp in the hospital at the same time. And it spurred me to ask whether this digital and IT transformation would influence women and men differently. And from there, this study started. So I would like to especially mention my collaborators in this project, namely uh, Professor Vivian Lim from the Department of Management and Organization at NUS Business School, um, Dr. Lim Arlun, Senior Consultant and Chief Medical Informatics Officer at NUH, and Dr. Amy Quack, uh, who is Senior Consultant at the Division of Neurology in NUH. So the title of our study is Gender and Technology Related Stress in the Healthcare Workplace. And we uh, hope that this study might provide insights into its impact on gender equality, human capital, and um, any potential solutions that might be suggested by um, the findings from our study. So as we know, there is a gender divide in technology, and this is a well-studied phenomenon supported by a vast body of literature. And often quoted is the proportion of women in STEM subjects in higher education and technology-related sectors, which still remain much lower than that of men. And by and large, women lag behind in skills to use technology and lag in the process of being creators of new technology. And in view of that, the rise of technological innovations that now pervade the workplace leads to the potential to undermine women's progress. And even as their jobs might be replaced by technology, we have heard from previous speakers that uh, women intrinsically have less time to reskill due to the other roles that they play. On the other hand, 
The majority of newly created occupations are in male dominated fields and worldwide men have better access to the internet, have larger networks, greater mobility and access to funding. And so the pressing question is whether technology and automation will provide women with new opportunities or leave them um, actually further behind. So um, some background of techno stress before moving on to my study proper. Techno stress is a term that is not new and was first coined in 1984 by psychologist uh, Craig Broad. And it refers to a syndrome that occurs when a person is subjected to computer and information technology and develops a state of stress. And um, stress happens when basically the demands of the environment kind of exceeds the person's ability to meet those demands. Um, since about 20, uh, 2008, this concept has been expanded upon by many in the field, which show that, that the repercussions of techno stress in work include loss of professional effectiveness, uh, role stress, and increasing absenteeism. So delving further into techno stress, there are five techno stress dimensions that have been described and studied, and they are illustrated here. So techno overload refers to the potential of IT to drive a person to work faster and longer. Whereas techno insecurity refers to um, the situation where a person feels threatened about losing their job to IT. Techno complexity refers to the condition where the inherent nature of IT makes a person feel inadequate regarding their computer skills. Um, Techno invasion, on the other hand, refers to the potential of IT to invade a person's personal life. And techno uncertainty refers to the constant upgrades that impose stress due to needing to relearn new skills. And the effects attributed to techno stress include psychosocial effects, such as the feeling of being overwhelmed, of anxiety, frustration, and fear, and avoidance physical symptoms such as headaches and fatigue, and organizational impacts such as low productivity, low job satisfaction, low work engagement, amongst others. So the effect of gender on techno stress varies between different settings. And while most studies found greater techno stress in women, a few of them found greater techno stress in men. And the effect may be population specific and varies between different settings as well as other factors. So for example, the influence of younger age, greater organizational seniority, uh, higher educational level, um, greater computer competence and higher technical support have been shown in several um, studies to lower techno stress levels. Techno stress in the healthcare setting has been studied mainly in the Western countries. And in a study, in a Swiss study of psychiatrists and nurses, men showed greater digital competence, which was in turn associated with lower stress levels, whereas nurses had the greatest amount of techno stress amongst the professions. And techno stress predicted burnout, quit intention, and adverse physical symptoms. In the study of Western nurses, techno stress inhibitors and moderators, which were supposed to mediate or reduce the amount of techno stress was strongly correlated with psychological responses. And these psychological responses correlated with job satisfaction and attrition. And there are moderating factors of techno stress already, um, such as computer self-efficacy, which is the individual's beliefs in their own abilities to competently use computers, IT literacy facilitation, which, is, which describes the mechanisms that the organization can do to foster sharing of knowledge that helps users to understand the IT systems. Workplace social support um, is basically an individual's perception of how supportive um, the organization as well as the supervisors and colleagues are in the organization itself and not just related to the IT aspects. And technical support provision refers to the way that technical support is being offered. And there has been uh, at least one study that showed that coping response was related to technical support. For example, emotional versus instrumental support preference varied between um, genders and depending on the person's uh, um, uh, uh, effectiveness or 
computer self-efficacy levels. So the key question that we were wanted to ask and to, and to get some idea from in this, uh, in this study was, in healthcare in Singapore, in a specific setting, does techno stress affect women disproportionately more than men? And how is techno stress in women associated with work and personal outcomes? And so we formulated a few research questions. So, um, and this were as such. The first is that we wanted to examine the pervasiveness of techno stress in women in healthcare across different job roles, such as physicians, nurses, allied health, and operational staff. And we will explore whether women are affected differently by techno stress than women, than men. And we hypothesize that women are more susceptible than men to techno stress. And the third was that what were the determinants um, of techno stress in women? So we want to examine factors that might predict techno stress in women. These potential factors are age, seniority, as well as job role. For example, nurses are so, so for example, are nurses more affected by techno stress than other job groups? Or um, are those uh, women in uh, certain job roles that requires a lot of interaction with computer and IT technology more likely to be affected by techno stress? And whereas are those with greater seniority or older age affected more or less? We also wanted to know if factors differ from, from men after controlling for variables such as job demands of the role. We also wanted to examine to what extent moderating factors reduce techno stress in women, such as IT literacy, self-efficacy, and workplace social support. And how does techno stress affect job outcomes in women? Um, we will examine work-related outcomes such as productivity, job satisfaction, quit intention, and job insecurity. We will also study a personal outcomes such as emotions, elicited by interactions with IT, as well as burnout. Um, and finally, does the perception of IT technical support effectiveness differ in women with different coping responses? So this is the diagram illustrating our research framework. The predictive or independent variables are depicted on the left, and the main outcome of interest is techno stress. The outcomes of techno stress are depicted on the right. And the moderating factors, such as workplace su social support, literacy, facilitation, computer self-efficacy, are uh, depicted here as the moderating factors that might affect uh, the degree of techno stress. To do this, we will conduct a survey-based study. We have compiled a validated questionnaire from published literature to measure the factors of interest. And uh, we have designed the survey instrument by administering one survey to measure the independent variable followed by a second survey uh, to measure the, in, the dependent variables. And uh, this study has uh, 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 received um, um, ethics approval. And we are plan in the stage where we are planning to deploy the survey instrument to collect data for analysis. Thereafter, to establish the construct validity of the five techno stress factors by confirmatory factor analysis. Um, the analysis of the survey data that we are planning to do will include the descriptive as well as inferential statistics. So um, we will describe um, the prevalence of techno stress. Um, and in terms of the inferential statistics, we will uh, perform analysis of variance as well as regression analysis with adjustment for covariates to determine any gender differences in techno stress and other relationships of interest. And if the data allows, we might uh, go on to perform structural equation modeling to test relationships between the factors. So in conclusion, um, we think that techno stress is now seen as one aspect of workplace health and safety. And the digital gender divide is already amongst us, while in healthcare, the users of IT are mostly women. So pre-existing gender divides may only be increased unless we take steps to address them. And it is timely to investigate the impacts of techno stress in healthcare given the rise of digital transformation in healthcare. And we want to raise awareness of this issue of how technology might impact women and their careers. And rather than a one size fits all solution, we hope to be able to identify ways of how uh, gender oriented uh, interactions with IT and when needed um, to, um, to see whether it's even uh, uh, feasible or desirable to integrate gender-oriented solutions um, to promote positive experiences with technology 
um, in, in women. Um, and these are my references. And um, that's the end of my presentation. And I'll be happy to take any questions later on uh, together with my other fellow uh, presentees. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for the excellent presentation, uh, Dr. Lee, as well as our two other uh, presenters. So I think right now what we have is about 10 minutes. Let's open up the time for some questions. And um, I already have a few questions uh, for our presenters. So uh, do I see them on my screen? Okay, great. So great. Okay, so maybe let me start off with a question for Dr. Shori. And that is, do you see any differences among the different regions in Southeast Asia that you think might be notable that could inform you about drivers uh, and the differences in perception and satisfaction that you may find? Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Gunn. Excellent uh, question. First and foremost, we did a qualitative systematic review. So like unlike quantitative systematic review, we can't really run certain tests to, to get the p-value to really see what are the differences. However, the synthesis did show um, the theme, especially coming or uh, emerged from the Asian context that having that you know, patriarchal cultural values were very strong um, uh, when uh, female academics, they shared their experiences because they've been told that, you know, um, they need to take a, a, a slow ride and they can wait, especially vividly. I remember there are some quotes uh, from academics where both husband and wife, they are from, um, you know, in academic academia and uh, female, they have to go slow uh, because of looking after and taking um, charge of the family values. Uh, so that was one. Another thing which was very vivid from the findings were that uh, female academics, they felt that, yes, um, many institutions, they have actually already introduced um, lots of great, um, you know, supportive interventions, for example, uh, slowing, down, uh, slowing down the tenure clock and also giving them some time uh, off um, during maternity period. But they felt that even though that was given, but back of the mind, they were always very concerned because their male counterparts, they were still going and producing and, uh, you know, getting grants and all that. So when they come back, they often feel that they're lagged behind. So that, that, that was the finding from the, the systematic review and specifically from the Southeast Asian side that, you know, when they go for maternity leave, the kind of, they, be, they go behind uh, uh, as compared to the other colleagues. I'm sure, um, just, just adding on my own views and also the, the recommendations or implications we have added in this systematic review, I'm sure I think it's probably already been done in many institutions, but having more balanced uh, policies and especially when there's a benchmarking done to uh, maybe, you know, consider these factors uh, women being um, having a maternity leave and then the 10 o'clock and how uh, then the quality and uh, uh, you know the final outcome of uh, uh, her tenure work yeah so that that's what the findings from the review over to you prof Gun. yeah thank yeah thanks so much i think this is so relevant right because we are seeing this also within our institution and maybe the criteria that we use to assess um people should be nuanced and rather than, you know, just now we heard from Prof. Eisen about, you know, its impact factor, how many publications before you go for your promotion and tenure. So, yeah, so I think these are all important factors. Now, moving on, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Clapman about your study as well. This is also a question coming in for you. And so um, maybe I start with uh, something that's a little bit shorter. And so about the stats that you presented, so do you have any sense of comparison with another country in Asia, maybe South Korea, for example? What, what is your sensing on that? Yeah. Or even with yeah, Western countries? Yeah, interesting, interesting question. So we haven't done any, any formal comparison. Um, looking at the literature internationally, um, the COVID uh, work for the publications Certainly, the last and first author was is not far off what the kind of international um, was looking uh, study from. I think it was BMJ Open looking at medical journals, and um, so that seemed fairly consistent um, internationally. How this would vary across countries, I don't know, and would be would be very interesting to certainly look at. So, if there's anyone in the in the audience who has links in in different countries and would like to collaborate on something like that, I think that would be that would be really informative. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Because I would like to say that in our June LNL or Lunch and Learn series, so coming out on June 29th, uh, we have a Japanese 
uh, professor researcher, and we will feature this later. So they are doing something similar to look at academic satisfaction and so on. So that's from the Japanese perspective. So I think that will be very good for comparison. Yeah, now, um, before I come back to you, Hannah, I would like to ask Dr. Lee uh, one more one question. And so this is about the technological stress, right? And so I think this is so relevant. We are undergoing so many different improvements. And so um, there's this question, okay, that I'm trying to find now. Um, so in the chat, okay. So it's about the concept of techno stress in the clinical IT system in Singapore. And, uh, you know, we have all moved online during the pandemic. So it seems like this is a perfect storm for potential, let's say, microaggression or everything that we've talked about this morning. And so can you comment on this, how we could handle potentially these issues uh, during this transformation, not just IT transformation, but cognitive bias transformation? Yeah. Yes, I think the handling of I suppose all these changes, I think it's an uh, interplay of a lot of different factors, which um, and but I think we can uh, it does depend a little bit on the individual, um, but I think we can kind of categorize it into a few ways. So um, one that uh, I did mention as the background of the study was how the organization can um, support this transformation and understand that um, there are different needs um, based on different individuals. And perhaps there are some uh, preferences in the way uh, women and men interact and how they interact with this support. Um, so, um, so, uh, so give a, a, a nice example from, from one of the studies that I was looking at. Um, they, they, they put a setting where uh, there was an IT uh, outage and <laughs> they found that um, um, interestingly, uh, some emotional support in the sense that uh, empathy was slightly more preferred by women um, uh, who have less a little bit less uh, uh, interaction with technology before. Whereas um, men, they tended to be more to the point in the sense that they wanted to know exactly what they needed to do. Um, and their stress level increased if they got too much empathy or, or, or you know, or this kind of, uh, of, of emotional support in the sense. So, Whereas women with, who are very uh, into technology, they actually just prefer instrumental support to tell them exactly what they needed to do. So, um, so, so uh, that's one perspective where we could be coming from, um, in the sense that to uh, the organization in a way might be able to uh, understand that there are some differences and deal with these different needs a little bit differently. The second is uh, to do with uh, individual responses or individual emotional responses to that situation. I think uh, all of us will be able to benefit from being able to take a step back and think about what our emotions are when we are dealing with that in order to be able to then address um, you know, uh, the, the way we are uh, reacting to a difficult situation with IT. Yeah, but um, of course, um, the COVID was an extreme situation where we Everybody had to move uh, at the at top speed, so yeah, it, it just brought out a, a lot a lot of issues with um, um, fast paced uh, changes. Yeah. Does this apply? There's a question that asks: Does this apply outside of let's say IT systems? Maybe with devices, with because even in the academic medicine, in medicine, you have a lot of technology advances. So with those devices, do you see? that same kind of techno stress, or can you also incorporate that well, into that system? Well, yeah, I, I can't really answer that question directly because, um, and whether we could include other kind of uh, devices, we had to limit the scope of our study to um, the work-related 
software applications that people are dealing with at the work. So um, we are not specifically going to look at mobile devices, Twitter or Facebook usage and that kind of thing. Um, okay, that's great. And now I want to go back to Hannah because there's a question kind of suggestion for you. Um, and that was, is it possible to generalize, you know, your search um, to any PubMed search term, for example, university affiliation? And is it possible to provide a live update, kind of like a dashboard of gender breakdown in publishing and where someone could just search for it? You know, favorite institute institution or other criteria. Yeah. Yeah, that would be great, right? Yeah, and we can have a little little competition going on between different institutions. And no, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think you know, as much as this information can kind of get out there in as useful way as as possible, and um, yeah, we would we would love to to do that. So that would certainly be something that would be be very interesting. And if the questioner has the uh, interest to to join us in that, then then please do. And if anyone else would be be interested, uh, I think that's. That's an, an important part of, of this kind of work. Um, institutions, yeah. So also, you know, institutions can probably actually do this kind of work more easily themselves because they will have internally, you know, they when going through uh, assessments and those kind of things, they will have all the information on what people are publishing and, and that kind of thing. So there's there's a role, I think, for institutions to be to be looking at this within their own and maybe it's already on, ongoing um, as well. But yeah, great suggestion. Thank you. I think our time is up. So thank you so much for um, sharing your research with us, for undertaking this. So we are very appreciative and we look forward to uh, greater findings uh, next year. So um, I'm going to pass the time over now. But before I do that, I just want to uh, let everyone know EOCD Grant Call is an annual affair. So we will be announcing the next grant call very soon. And the details will be in there. It's a $10,000 max grant. And so please, please send in your applications. So thank you very much. And now passing the time over to the MCs. All right, thank you very much, Professor Gan and all the recipients of the EOCDC grants. So congratulations on, on getting those grants and, and good luck on the research. They all sound like really exciting projects. We look forward to the results. So I would now like to introduce the Vice Dean of Academic Affairs at NUS Medicine, Associate Professor Su Lin Lin. Professor Sue has a unique perspective from her administrative role in faculty recruitment, appraisal, and promotion, as well as her academic role as head of the Division of Maternal and Fetal Medicine in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. So we're really looking forward to her perspectives on breaking the bias. Professor Sue, over to you. Thank you, Swent. First of all, uh, a big thank you to the committee for giving me this time to share um, on this very important topic from the perspective of the academic affairs. So maybe just before I touch on academic affairs, I think many of you know that uh, I come from the Department of uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology. And uh, even though the work is very demanding from the specialty, um, people who know me know that I really enjoy the specialty. And many junior doctors have asked me why. Okay, so I've reflected on this and uh, the, the true fact is that uh, really uh, the same as, you know, our dean who is also in the same specialty and my head of department, uh, Professor Mahesh Cholani, we, for us, we really uh, truly enjoy empowering uh, our women during their pregnancy journey and during their delivery. Okay. And, but it's also through this specialty where we really see the strengths of women and we come face to face to understand the many challenges and the struggles that they do face. Okay, so one example that I give is there are instances where I tell them that, you know, I think you need to get some rest. And the answer is, no, I need to mark this uh, exam scripts for my students who are coming up with the PSLE exams. You know, I need to submit this grant and I need to write papers. So I've seen you know, expecting women sitting in the waiting room waiting for their turn to be seen while working on their laptop for their publication. So this really you know, show us uh, the different uh, tasks that uh, they as women have, um, have to uh, establish. Then after that, I was invited to join the Academy Affairs. And I realized that you know, under the leadership of uh, 
the CE Prof Yo and Dean Prof Chon, there are really many opportunities uh, uh, for me to play a role to enforce equal opportunities for both gender. And I'm particularly grateful to Yun and team for setting up uh, EOCD uh, under Academy Affairs. Okay, so let me just briefly introduce Academy Affairs um, for those who are not familiar with the division. So it's a division uh, in our deanery, which is the equivalent of a human resource, uh, sp but specifically looking after our academic faculty. Okay, so uh, we look after our researchers, our educators, as well as our clinicians. So at Academy Affairs, uh, my different teams look after areas including recruitment, uh, faculty appointments, promotion and tenure, as well as appraisals. So these portfolios that uh, we are in charge of really help us to gain a greater insight into the specific challenges that uh, women face during their career progression. Many of these challenges have been mentioned in today's talk. So issues related to impact factor, uh, the common questions asked are, you know, how would my pregnancy affect my work? Does it affect my promotion? I may not be able to attend so many overseas conferences due to family commitment. What do I do? Okay. How do I balance between my academic career and my family commitments? So it's through understanding all these challenges that the team can strive to explore options to ensure that each of our faculty can reach his or her fullest potential. We work very closely with the university and including working on institutionalized uh, HR policies. And I'm very thankful that our leaders at the university are very open and very supportive of initiatives and of our quest to support our academic staff. So like uh, Shafali has mentioned, um, the tenure clock can be extended uh, for our lady faculty members who uh, have been through pregnant, who, who are pregnant. Okay. So there are many uh, initiatives that we continue to work with the university um, in order to help support um, our faculty members. So today I'm very inspired by all the different presentations and um, many of the points uh, really struck with me at it first, uh, and the point that is made by Professor Eisen on, you know, using the privilege uh, really touched my heart that, you know, if say we are in a position where we have the privilege to make a difference, it is really, you know, a shame if we don't put that to good use. So I think that really um, tells me that I, uh, me and the team together with Yung, uh, with the EOCD will need to continue, will have a lot of work to do coming up. I would like to thank the EOCD grant recipients for their research. The EOCD through the Academy Affairs will continue to keep watch over the leaky pipeline and collate timely data to identify points where we are leaking. The Academy Affairs will also work with EOCD to consolidate training workshops on mentorship and connective bias to raise awareness of this very important issue. The School of Medicine will continue to be cautious and intentional in our recruitment efforts to embrace principle of diversity and inclusion. And this means to ensure that our selection committees are aware of any potential cognitive bias and implement steps to mitigate. We also promise to be committed to have broad representation in our important committees. So with that, uh, on behalf of the Academy Affairs, we really look forward to partner with all of you towards a more equal and inclusive workplace and society. Thank you. So thank you, Prof. Sue, for your insights and for your dedication into supporting our women faculty. And with that, I would like to bring today's NUHS WISH and EOCD International Women's Day Conference to a close. Thank you to all our guests, our speakers, panelists, grant recipients, and most of all, to you for joining, joining us today. 
Simply attending demonstrates an intention that we hope will carry forward to other actions, such as those mentioned by Sophia. And to not only be more aware, but also to take more responsibility and act to help break the bias. And thank you, Lena, for co-hosting this with me today. And for everybody here, please be on the lookout for the things that you heard about today. There's the upcoming NUHS WISH and ELCD events. So WISH will be doing another Lunch and Learn in June. Uh, and then, as you heard, there'll be another EOCD grant call coming up. So thanks, thanks to everyone for joining us this morning. And to, together, let's continue to work to break the bias. Thank you. Thank you. And goodbye.